So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Peter Hillebrand from Leipzig and the Berlin Institute of Health. And I would like to welcome you to this very special evening with Brian Kubilka and Roger Sunahara. And uh, this is also the kickoff talk for the Young Scientists meeting. So we have uh, many young scientists amongst us that are going to participate in a meeting that will keep on going the whole week. So maybe you can identify yourself by putting up your hand. Ah, yeah. So welcome. <laughs> so guests from all over the world, but also welcome all the guests from Berlin. And uh, yeah, on behalf of the committee of this, oops, of this um, Young Scientist meeting, we look forward to the next days. But first, we start with the meeting today. And um, I have the honor to thank all the sponsors for um, the Young Scientist meeting. So I just go out of the view. And especially the Einstein Stiftung and the Stiftung Charité, who is funding a collaboration between Berlin and Stanford. So Brian has become an Einstein visiting fellow last year, and I'm very proud to host him here in Berlin. And uh, yeah, special thanks from my group, Brian, and from the group of Patrick for the nice collaborations and scientific exchange. It's really intriguing and yeah, it's a lot of fun, <laughs> actually. So a few words to Brian and Roger. So everybody of you will know that Brian received the Nobel Prize in 2011. But what you may not know that is that Brian Bilka was born and raised in Little Falls. This is in Minnesota. And his father and grandfathers were bakers. Um, probably you, you, this joke that you baked crystal structures or structures of receptors you had to hear too often. So, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Um, but he studied uh, at the University of Minnesota, Dallas, where he earned his medical degree from Yale University. So he's a medical doctor, which also fits very well into the landscape of research here in Berlin, where we have this big clinic, the Charité. And uh, yeah, this was in New Haven, Connecticut. And after completing his residency in St. Louis, Minnesota, he moved to Duke University, Durham, where he conducted his Nobel Prize awarded research together with Bob Lefkowitz. And uh, yeah, he received the Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work on G-protein capped receptors in 2011. And a big impact in his research was made by his dear colleague, um, Roger Sunahara. And uh, Roger, he is professor of pharmacology at the University of California in San Diego. And his lab is specialized in structure and function of GPCRs and G-proteins. We will hear more about this. And uh, he started his research career in the University of Michigan Medical School in Ann Harbor. And in 2015, he moved his lab from there to California, San Diego, um, Loyola, to continue his research over there. And um, you may ask yourself how uh, we came to this special frame, so having two scientists talking on one topic. And this was coming up when Patrick and I and Johanna, we met Brian and Roger at this meeting in, uh, on Hawaii, Big Island. So don't think of holidays now, think of exciting work. Intensive work, but also little holidays. <laughs> um, and there we had this idea that these two scientists could present their work together. And uh, the reason is that these two scientists have been collaborating for many years. They have competing before, so it's a very interesting scientific uh, development. And uh, this is something that we want to bring closer to you with this special event today especially for the young scientists of you who may ask yourselves, 
how is it to have such a breakthrough or what personality does one require to, to do this and uh, for Brian it was very important to collaborate so he always stressed this at any stage and therefore we thought it's a good idea um, to combine this here and when you now look at this photo from Brian so this is I copied this from um, the Nobel Committee, so you see somebody very proud and distinguished. And when we look on this, we probably also feel a little, little bit distance, distant because it's, I mean, probably nobody else here will become Lority. And so we look at this photo, but uh, this photo doesn't show Brian in his most important moment, uh, namely when uh, he elucidated the structure of the receptor G protein complex, and, and this is probably is this, this is also not the moment, yeah, because uh, this is a moment a little bit afterwards. But this is Brian and Roger and Søren Rasmussen and other co-workers driving home from elucidation of the X-ray structure, so at asynchrotron, I assume. And when I look into the faces, they look very happy and also very exhausted. So the few of you who have been ever had uh, the opportunity to measure X-ray crystals, they know that this is normally something that you do over the night. So you have a measure, you're measuring 12 hours, 16 hours. And if you look like this afterwards, then you must have found something very important. And uh, yeah, when Brian was interviewed later about his finding and also his career, which also had some obstacles, you know. Um, and he was asked, what kept you on going through these difficult times? Then Brian asked, uh, answered, I don't know. It was just something that I really wanted to see. He meant the complex of receptor G protein. And I had a great group of colleagues working on it. And we were all excited about doing it. And uh, now we are very excited about listening to you, Brian, and first of Roger, and see how the receptor meets G protein. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the uh, to Peter uh, for the introduction. Thank you for the committee for in, for organizing committee for inviting us and putting together this really fantastic um, symposium. And thank you again to the to Charité as well as Einstein Foundation. We've really been here for about 45 minutes and just meeting people, and it's been wonderful. Thank you very much. And it's going to be fun. I think Brian. This is the first time Brian and I have, have sort of done this type of forum. We've talked about our research maybe on back-to-back -back talks, mostly, you know, what we've done recently. But um, this will be a little bit different. We're going to, each of us are going to talk about um, more of a historical perspective, not only in the field, but also try to give a historical uh, perspective on our collaboration and, and where and why we started collaborating. And as Peter um, mentioned, when, I, when we first started on this project, Brian, we, we were in competition with, we were working on the same project. The goal was to determine the crystal structure of the receptor G protein complex. His lab in Stanford and my lab in, in, in Ann Arbor. And so it's of course worked out differently, but uh, we, we've had a lot of fun in the meantime. So 
it's so funny. Um, the title was When Receptor Meets G Protein. And you can tell who's a G protein person because it's when G protein meets the receptor. <laughs> Um, uh, um, you've noted that Brian and, and my lab, and particularly Brian, has really done amazing work, and it, but it's been a team. It's always been a team. He's had a team of fantastic collaborators, and what Brian has amazing insight is to pick collaborators, amazing collaborators. And this is a photograph of... Um, sort of a post-party celebration in, in one of these Hawaii meetings. This was back in 2011. And um, it was after the structure was solved, before the Nobel Prize, but after the structure was solved. And you can see a lot of the, um, the players, and, and we'll talk about them in, in our talks, that were really instrumental in this project. So this was um, a very old but fun figure put together um, a long time ago, 1957, by Earl Sutherland. And what he was describing was hormonal regulation of cyclic AMP formation. Earl Sutherland won the Nobel Prize, of course, for the discovery of cyclic AMP. And what he determined back, or hypothesized back then, was that there was a membrane protein that would, could bind hormone, either glucagon, or in this case, he was interested in epinephrine, and that that hormone binding event would lead to activation of um, and production of cyclic AMP, which would turn on protein kinase A and, and regulate um, uh, uh, glycogen synthesis. But it was a single membrane protein entity that was thought to be responsible for the entire signaling uh, event. We, of course, know that that's much more complicated and that there's a uh, receptor involved, a heterotrimeric G protein involved. And it's, they, they um, interact with each other very intimately, and they um, all are, have varying activities, including binding as well as enzymatic activity. The most important, of course, step that I think is most important is the, the, the activation of the G protein. That's primarily done by the hormone bound receptor, where it tickles the G protein so that it makes the alpha subunit lose its nucleotide GDP so that it can bind GTP. GTP in the cell concentration is quite high, it's about 200 micromolar in an average cell. So if nucleotide pops off in a cell, GTP will immediately bind. And that binding event will lead to conformational changes in the alpha subunit so that it'll let go of beta gamma, so that each one of those subunits can now interact with the, their effectors. And the effector I've put here is adenyl cyclase, of course, the, the enzyme that uh, Earl Sutherland had, had described, in which the adenyl cyclase would, would catalyze the formation of cyclic AMP. The alpha subunit, in addition to binding nucleotide, it actually hydrolyzes nucleotide to GDP and, and or, um, uh, uh, orthophosphate. And that conversion actually turns out to be a nice little timing mechanism because when it's GTP bound, it has very high affinity for cyclase. When it's GDP bound, it has a much lower affinity for cyclase. In fact, it would rather rebind beta gamma once it hydrolyzes. Uh, GTP to GDP. And when it hydrolyzes and re reforms this heterotrimer, it can again interact with the receptor. But as you can see, and as described by Earl Sutherland back in, the, back in the 50s, was that the most important step in this whole signaling cycle is this single step, the hormone binding event leading to activation of the G protein. And this is what we've been sought, um, trying to uh, determine this mechanism and what it looks like through um, for uh, structural biology. So that coupling event had been described many, many years ago, not by X-ray crystallography, but by radial ligand binding. And this is a very famous um, binding curve. This was done a long time ago by Mike McGuire when he was a postdoc in Alfred Gilman's lab. And this, this is from his pa the first paper in 1976. What they had done was used an antagonist to bind to the beta adrenergic receptor, and they could compete that radioactive antagonist with a cold antagonist. You can see alprenolol nicely inhibited the, the, the uh, radioactive probe. What was interesting was that epinephrine, an agonist, also inhibited 
uh, antagonist binding, but its inhibition profile was completely different than alprenolol. What was more interesting was when you uncoupled the G protein from this complex with the addition of a non-hydrolyzable analog, GMP-PNP, you completely changed the, the binding profile of epinephrine. In fact, the inhibition curve much, looked much more closely, uh, more close to the um, antagonist alprenolol. And so what was thought at the time, still thought uh, that same mechanism, is that by uncoupling the G protein, you, you lose the high affinity epinephrine binding. And so epinephrine, therefore, actually binds at two different states, a low affinity state and a high affinity state. But by uncoupling the G protein, you disrupt the high affinity state, and you end up with just a one clear low affinity state. And so th this is the basis of G protein coupling um, through, a, through a receptor. It's this relationship. So now we know, of course, many, many years later, that there are many receptors more than just the beta-adrenergic receptors that are putatively coupled to G proteins. In fact, that the, as you know, they're the largest family of membrane proteins. But I would like to point out that this receptor, the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, was uh, one of the first, well, actually, Brian corrected me and he's absolutely right. Uh, this is the first GPCR cloned uh, of all the GPCRs. It wasn't the first sequence determined, because rhodopsin was determined by, by sequencing, whereas Brian and colleagues actually cloned the gene. And it started a whole revolution, which ended up identifying over 800 different GPCRs. There are also, to complicate signaling, many G proteins. Many G protein alpha subunits, many different G protein beta subunits and many different G protein gamma subunits. And of course, the alpha subunits, which largely um, regulate different type of effectors, um, can couple to different com um, uh, combinations of beta and gamma subunits, which also can couple to different effector systems. But you can imagine that this large collection, the, the number of permeability, uh, permutations and combinations of G proteins and receptors could be astounding. And so, um, the Gilman lab, and as well as Paul Siegler's lab, had really focused on one of two G proteins to try to gain, gain an understanding of how these G proteins work from an enzymatic as well as a structural point of view. So here's the structure of the of GI heterotrimer. Here's the alpha subunit in yellow, beta in blue, and gamma in magenta, gamma 2. And you can see the interaction between alpha and beta is through um, one main component, the, uh, the switch 2 regions. There are three switch regions, switch 1, switch 2, and switch 3, and they're named such because they move quite dramatically depending on what kind of nucleotide is bound in the site. But I really want to focus on switch 2 because switch 2 is the primary interactor with, beta, with the beta, uh, beta and gamma. And it's, of course, um, the binding of GTP influences the conformations which involve not only binding beta-gamma, but also binding effector. So when, when you bind GTP to a um, typical alpha subunit, you get quite a dramatic change in these switch domains, and you can see in this morph that I'll have in a second, is this dramatic change in this switch to domain right here. That's the GDP-bound GDP structure. And as you uh, morph into the GTP-bound structure, you can see how switch two completely reorganizes and forms a really interesting 310 helix. And that helix is uh, present, and the shape of the helix is present either with GTP bound to gamma thio itself or GTP, um, or bound to adenylyl cyclase. This is just a different view. You can see how this switch 2 domain is sandwiched between the alpha 2 and alpha 3 helix of the C2 domain of adenylyl cyclase. And so what you may or may not know is that <clears throat> this switch 2 is probably the chief switch that determines whether it's 
G protein bound or effector bound itself. And you can see in this, these various structures now that have been solved, either a trimer, G, G alpha subunit alone, bound to a dental cyclase, bound to an, uh, a GTP, GTPase activating protein or RGS protein, bound to, for in the case of transducin, PDE gamma, as well as alpha subunit bound to PLC. In all these structures, it clearly, um, clearly shows that switch two is engaged and interacting with these domains. And so you can sort of um, make a little movie, um, to, to a structural movie to sort of uh, depict this G protein cycle that Earl Suther or that uh, Alfred Gilman had worked out back in the 80s, and where the where G protein um, GTP binding to the alpha subunit will cause a functional dissociation of gamma, so that it opens up switch two, so that it may, in fact, bind an effector such as adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase, when it's bound to the G protein itself, now can recognize ATP, catalyze the formation of cyclic AMP, and the G protein itself, because it's a G protein, it, it's a, a GTPase, can hydrolyze GTP to GDP, and that hydrolysis event will change the structure of the switch domain, switch two domain, and then the switch cyclase, as I said earlier, um, has a low affinity for the G protein in this GDP bound form, will dissociate, and the alpha subunit would prefer to rebind beta gamma. And so that's the G protein, and that's, what, that's the basic behavior of a, of a G protein. But what is really missing, obviously, is this very important step that Earl Sutherland had, had described to be one of the key steps. Yes, we, can, we've, we now know how the G protein gets turned on and turned off, but how does it exchange nucleotide? What does the receptor do when it binds hormone receptor? The problem with G proteins and, as, and receptors is they're membrane bound. People forget that G proteins are actually membrane proteins because they're all isolated in various forms, either through merstate, palmitate, both on the alpha subunit and um, dranyl geranylated or farnesylated on the, on the gamma subunits. And receptor, of course, you know, they're membrane, integral membrane proteins. In order to purify them, you need to extract them away from um, uh, from the membrane with a detergent. And so we wanted to study this uh, from a structural point of view, just like, just like others had studied on, on the G-protein alpha subunits, but in a complex with the receptor. But it turns out to be exceedingly difficult, not only to study them, but also to actually measure their activities. And so, it, so when I was... Um, starting my lab and trying to work out how we can, how we can make this complex, I, I read all of Brian's papers. And at that at the particular time, Brian, that I was interested in this, Brian had published a whole series of papers, and this is in the, in the early 2000s, where he was inspired by work from Dave Farrens when he was working with Gobin Karana. And using EPR spectroscopy, he was able to determine that TM6 moved considerably, and as well as others had done this as well, um, considerably upon activation um, by light. Of course, the work from, from, Peter, from Peter's lab. So inspired by this, what Brian decided to do is label the bottom of TM6 with a fluorophore, in this case TMR, tetramethylrhodamine to see if he can detect a change in, it, in the fluorescence of, of um, this um, TMR as a measure of movement of TM6. And it's exactly what he saw. So here is a um, uh, fluorescence uh, measurement of TMR labeled beta receptor in response to isopaterinol. And you can see isopaterinol very rapidly cause this change, or relatively rapidly, cause this change in fluorescence that could be inhibited or competed for with alprenolol. The one problem was that it was a little bit slow. 
in detergent micelles, this is in dodecylmaltoside, you can see the T half for isopaternol was about 230 seconds. So while I was reading through these papers and piling through this, this incredible assay that Brian had developed and measure of, of a binding activity and conformational change, we were also working on trying to develop methods to study the receptor itself. And we knew from the literature and from old literature that, um, that um, GPCR activity um, was negatively affected by detergents and, and receptors much preferred lipid bilayers. And we developed this system in the lab using high-density lipoproteins, discoidal high-density lipoproteins. Um, we call them RHDLs, but many of you may know them as nanodisks. And by reconstituting the receptor into these uh, HDLs, we are able to restore a lot of the binding activity. In this case, in this bar graph, it shows you um, some purified receptor, and we are able to measure um, antagonist binding. And if we added back lipid or add back APOA1, which is the protein which acts as a belt, which holds the lipid together, and then remove detergent, we can completely restore all the binding that we started with in detergent micelles. Um, but in this case, it's in lipid and there's absolutely no detergent. And we've, like, as I said earlier, we've known that um, detergents have, are quite deleterious for receptor binding. And you can see in this competition, in this um, a saturation curve where alprenolol and antagonist is binding, the affinity is about five to tenfold lower than in membranes, in this case, insect cell membranes. Whereas reconstituted receptors in HDL had sort of a, uh, a profile in between those two. If we added cholesterol into those HDL particles, we could actually shift it over leftward shift and they would really essentially be superimposed on um, membrane preparations from insect cells. So this really gave us, gave us the idea that um, these receptors really prefer to be in lipid. And so I was at a Gordon conference um, in 2005. Yeah, 2005. And my grad student, um, Matt Warden, the one who had actually done the reconstitutions, had, was presenting a poster and had presented a poster on some of that work. And I knew that this was something that Brian could use, this um, reconstituted system, because I, I thought that he'd be able to do the same spectroscopy, the TMR fluorescence spectroscopy. But maybe he could do it in, a, in our HDL preparation. So I dragged him over to the poster and he started looking at it and he was, I could, he was quiet. I didn't know him very well. In fact, at that time, really, we were still competing. But I, I knew that he had this amazing technique that no one else had. And I knew that he could measure receptor conformation. Uh, something that could reflect receptor conformation. And I thought that I could, we could work together to try to make a better system. And within a week after the, after the um, Gordon Research Conference, we were able to produce this curve. And you can see here, this is the same thing, but reconstituted receptor, TMR labeled beta receptor, reconstituted in lipid. And you can see the time course is now is completely changed. It's a, rather than it being a single exponential with a T half of about 230 seconds, it was actually um, a double, uh, double exponential. And where the fast component was basically occurring within diffusion limits of our, because of our mixing, and then it was a slow component of about 100, 180 seconds. But it was completely different than in detergent micelles. So it really gave us the idea that lipid's critical for not only binding ligand, but also for conformation. And this is the system we, may, we work, could work with. And so we decided, OK, well, let's just go for it. Let's take reconstituted receptor and throw G protein at it. And in fact, we were able to, to recapitulate the same curve that Mike McGuire had done back in the 1976, that very first competition curve I showed you. But in this case, with purified components, 
we can see that by adding in um, GTP, gamma thiol, we can uncouple the G protein and hormone, in this case, our isoproterenol, an agonist, um, his affinity would be dramatically impaired by adding gamma thiol. And on top of that, since we're dealing with purified components, both receptor and G protein, we can force the receptor with high concentrations of G protein to adopt, is that rain? <laughs> and sun? Okay. I'm from San Diego where we've had very little rain, so this is really, <laughs> this is really special. So as we added more G protein, we, we were able to actually completely change over and completely shift all the receptors to the high affinity state. So every receptor was coupled to a G protein, and then we can uncouple it again by adding GTP gamma thio. So what this experiment told us is that we, it may be possible to isolate a homogeneous population of receptors coupled to G proteins, and hopefully in its nucleotide free form. And so at the same time um, we were doing this, Brian was working on a really interesting um, fluorophore, monobromobimane, Again, uh, this is an, um, basically inspired by Dave Farrens at, at um, OHSU at, in Portland, and where Dave had labeled um, uh, rhodopsin with bimane and looked at conformational changes. But what Brian did is he had characterized the TMR labeling of cysteine-265 fairly well on the beta receptor and then tried monobromobimane. What's interesting about monobromobimane is it's very small. It's about the size of tryptophan. It's not like TMR, which is huge. And so he would get, be able to get rid of a lot of the potential artifacts. And so here's a, a, a scan of, um, a weight length scan of monobromal biamine labeled beta 2 reconstituted in, in HDL. And you can see that the receptor alone has a peak of about 448 nanometers, but as soon as you add either isoproterenol agonist or G protein, you get a dramatic decrease in the fluorescence as well as a, right, uh, a red shift in the, in the lambda max. And that, that um, shift is actually very consistent with, with, at the time, we didn't have a crystal structure, not of the beta receptor at least, but movement of TM6 um, away from um, uh, the core. And in fact, this model was um, derived from work from, from Patrick Shear when he was work with, um, with Peter and, and Oliver Ernst on, 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 this, um, uh, um, on rhodopsin. And what was nice about this assay is this change in fluorescence in response to isoproterenol occurred in a concentration-dependent manner. If you plotted the concentration of isoproterenol versus the lambda max, the wavelength, the maximal wavelength at which it fluoresces, you can generate a very nice dose-response curve. And that dose-response curve pretty well mirrors the binding uh, curve uh, using a radioactive um, uh, probe antagonist dihydroprenolol and competing with an isoproterenol, you can see that the inflection point is about is the same whether you look at fluorescence or binding. Really telling us that this uh, this fluorophore is really nice, the sensor. So whether you add in G protein or isoproterenol, they they introduce this decrease in fluorescence, or in other words, a movement in, in TM6. And what's, what's really nice is that you can add them two together. If you add G protein and isoproterenol, you can get an even further shift in the spectra. And that shift and the cooperativity that occurs between the G protein and the receptor is very similar to the cooperativity that's observed by radial ligand binding. But what also you can see is you can, you can disrupt that um, interaction with, of the G protein and uncouple the G protein from the receptor and you can get an increase and in, restore the fluorescence as if the receptor didn't even have a G protein coupled. So we can either look at coupling by fluorescence now or coupling by radial ligand binding.
So, Earl Sutherland, or back in the early models, the receptor G protein complex, which is the key step, is the trigger to make it nucleotide free, was our goal. And we had these really cool assays, but we had to determine, is this receptor G protein complex nucleotide free or not? And so to, to, to study that, we decided to study this shift in response to GTP gamma thiol as a function of time. And you can see from the scan, as soon as you add in GTP gamma thiol, you get a dramatically increase, as if there was no nucleotide bound, and then GTP bound in a diffusion-limited manner, and you got this increase, increase in fluorescence as a readout of uncoupling. And whether you me measure fluorescence or you measure actually radioactive GTP gamma thiol binding, it basically is over before your first measurement point, suggesting that what we had isolated, this receptor G protein complex and lipid, is nucleotide free. This bimane, this bimane fluorescence assay was also interesting in that it can actually define some of the properties, the pharmacological properties, rather the efficacy of the ligands. So as I showed you before, um, beta receptor, when you bind G protein, you get a decrease in fluorescence, bimane fluorescence. Well, Isoterenol, you get a decrease in bimane fluorescence. If you add them both, you can get a further increase in fluorescence. But what about ligands which have different efficacy, such as an inverse agonist? Well, inverse agonist did exactly what, what it should do. It bound to the receptor, put the receptor in an inactive conformation, and whether you added a little bit or even saturating or supersaturating concentrations of G protein, you got no decrease in fluorescence, really supporting the notion that inverse agonists, such as ICI-118-551, really stabilizes the inactive form and doesn't allow G proteins to couple. Okay, so we think we have this nucleotide-free receptor G protein complex, at least measured by fluorescence. Can we isolate it? So we decided, Matt Wharton, the grad student in the lab, decided, okay, well, let's just try this out. Let's take reconstituted receptor and um, run through a gel filtration column. And you can see it comes off the column about, I don't know, 20, 20, 23, uh, fraction 23 or 24. And then you can resolubilize it in dodecymaltoside, get rid of the lipid. You can see that resolubilization causes a dramatic shift in the retention time, and it's retained on the column much longer, meaning it's much smaller. It comes off the column about fraction 30. But then you can also take this reconstituted receptor and then add in um, G protein, and then add in dodecymaltoside. So you're making the complex, and you're solubilizing that complex in dodecylmaltoside. And what we realized what happened is that when we solubilized, we maintained this really large peak. And it didn't shift over completely to the blue peak, suggesting that this peak was a receptor G protein complex that, we can, that can survive detergent, dodecymaltoside. And on top of that, if we added in GTP gamma thiol and uncoupled it, it behaved just like um, the solubilized receptor itself. So this was one of the first hints that not only can we make this complex, it's nucleotide free, but we can actually enrich it and potentially purify it. So to sort of summarize a lot of this, We've, we've known that the receptor, when it binds, hor binds hormone through the bimane spectroscopy, for example, we can see the TM6 quite, moves quite dramatically, allowing the G protein to, to bind and couple and, and allowing nucleotide to fall out. We also know from previous studies that GTP binding can, can result in changes in, sw in the switch two domain and that binding event disrupts the interaction between the alpha subunit and the beta gamma subunit and allows the alpha subunit and beta gamma subunits to interact with their respective effectors. 
So, we have a nice system to look at the confirmation of the receptor. We, we, we think we, we know what's going on in terms of um, the cooperativity between the receptor and G protein. We think that it, we can isolate and define what is the nucleotide free form. But it never really explained why epinephrine could bind with high affinity. And this is a chief component of this whole complex. And so, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but it sort of inspired us to, to try to develop tools in which we can use to, to try to study this. Because it was a very interesting phenomenon that my, my um, graduate student, uh, Giselle Velez Ruiz, and as well as Brian DeVry, had come up with. And they had thought, perhaps G protein coupling, when you're binding to an agonist, stabilizes some confirmation. Um, obviously, the nucleotide pops out. But when nucleotide pops out, it must change the receptor itself. And one of the easiest things to change in the receptor would perhaps be its exit pathway out of the binding site. And so they came up with it, we came up with a really simple model in which receptors normally are in what we call the open inactive conformation. So open ligands can bind quickly, but can also dissociate quickly. And we think that it's this state of the receptor, which is in fact the uncoupled state that Mike McGuire and others had defined back in the 70s. But since agonists, when they bind, as I mentioned before, can stabilize nucleotide loss, that nucleotide loss, which can be mimicked by a, a, a reagent I'm going to describe in a minute, stabilizes a conformational change in the receptor so that the receptor itself adopts what we call the closed active conformation. And by closing this vestibule, it slows that down the dissociation of ligand. And by slowing down the dissociation, you actually garner high affinity binding to the, to the uh, receptor or to the ligand. And we think that it's this closed active conformation which is responsible for what we call G-protein coupling, this high affinity agonist binding state. And it was helped a lot, this model was helped a lot by crystal structures. I'm going to have another morph, and this is going to morph between the beta adrenergic receptor bound to um, uh, G-protein or receptor bound to um, an inverse agonist, uh, carazolol. And what I want you to, to look at are these two aromatic residues, the tyrosine, tyrosine 308, and this phenylalanine, phenylalanine 193, as you go from the inactive to the active conformation. And you can see that these two aromatic residues come significantly closer. And it's a lot easier to see in the space filling where you're transitioning between the inactive to the active the inactive open to the active closed. And so that's the model of it. That's some crystal structures of it. How about radial ligand binding? So what Brian decided to do is take reconstituted receptor, add in G protein, treat it with a, a, um, a pyrase, and Brian will talk about a pyrase in a second, but what it does is it hydrolyzes GDP. Any GDP which is hanging around in here in the G protein, as it falls off, a pyrase will chop it up and get rid of it. And so he cooked the G protein with the receptor and then did a, a saturation curve with dihydrolprenolol. And we were thinking, okay, we're going to make this complex. All of our receptors are going to be coupled to G protein and we're going to see 100% alprenolol binding. But in fact, we saw a very small fraction of alprenolol binding, unless we uncoupled the G protein from the receptor. We're dealing with purified components here. We knew exactly how many femtomoles a receptor was in that test tube, but it was not six femtomoles. It was about 20. So somehow, G protein coupling affected antagonist binding. 
No agonist present here, just antagonist binding. And as I mentioned before, whoop, I'm think I'm out of order. I am out of order. Um, we were able to take advantage of a really interesting reagent that was um, uh, through a collaboration now uh, with Jan Steyr at uh, Free University in, in Brussels. And this is another GRC, Gordon Research Conference, interaction where Brian and I were at this meeting, I think it was 2009, in, um, in Italy. And this gruff scientist, Belgian scientist, Jan, came up to us as we were just sitting chatting and he said, you have to come over to see my poster because I've got this reagent which I think is gonna really help, help you. It's a cool reagent. Because what Jan's been developing were camelid antibodies, which are single chain antibodies. And then he's isolated the FAB sort of um, fraction of these camelid antibodies, in which he called nanobodies. And these little nanobodies can be made in E. coli, and, um, and they're, they're quite powerful reagents. And so that started a huge collaboration in a huge area of research. And the first thing Brian did was, Brian's lab did, was to take agonist-bound beta receptor and inject llamas. And then we were able to isolate, or they were, um, Jan was able to isolate the first nanobody, whoops, NB80. Wow, sorry about that. There's something wrong with NB80, which bound into the core of the receptor. And what's interesting about NB80 is NB80 behaved exactly like G protein. So here, here's an agonist inhibition of antagonist binding when, when supersaturating concentrations of G protein are added. You can see you get a complete leftward shift. This NB80, instead of the G protein, behaved exactly the same way. So it looked like, at least pharmacologically, that nanobody 80 is a nice G protein mimic. And then Brian's lab was able to solve the crystal structure of NB80 bound to the receptor. And it bound, in fact, to the same place that Patrick's uh, um, structure suggested based on transduce and bound, bound to um, opsin, occupying the same site. And in, because NB80 could be made in bacteria, and because it's very stable as a soluble protein, you can test it at very high concentrations. In this case, you can add up to 20 micromolar, or in this case, 16 micromolar, in our binding assays. And you can see that you can get a shift of almost three log units for epinephrine. And so the idea now was to see if we can use this nanobody force it onto the receptor and drive the receptor to ad adopt, without an agonist, this closed active conformation, just by concentration, by high concentrations of nanobody. And what, what, in theory, what should have happened was you should have stabilized this closed conformation, and even an antagonist should not be able to gain access into the core of the receptor. And this is exactly what, he, what Brian did. He looked at the kinetics, Brian DeVry, graduate student in the lab, looked at kinetics of binding of alprenolol with no nanobody or in the presence of very high concentrations of nanobody, 30 micromolar, and you dramatically slowed the on rate of alprenolol. Interestingly, you dramatically slowed the on rate of an agonist, in this case, formoterol. You also in, increased, slow down the, the binding of uh, an inverse agonist, carvedilol. So regardless of the efficacy, whether it's an antagonist, agonist, or an inverse agonist, what G protein in its nucleotide free form or nanobody 80 stabilize this closed active conformation of the receptor and clearly nothing can actually get into the core. And so Brian decided, well, if that's true, then maybe we can do the experiment in a different way. We can pre-label the receptor with alprenolol, our, our radioactive probe, and then throw high concentrations of nanobody on it and see if we can drive the closed conformation, but then trap our antagonist into the core of the receptor and have it mimics the, G, the nucleotide-free G protein. 
And this is exactly the experiment he did. He tried to look at the off rate of alprenolol to see, if, see how, in the absence of nanobody, alprenolol rapidly dissociated. But if you incubate it with nanobody, you can dramatically slow down the, the, the um, alprenolol dissociation. This is really interesting. This is a G protein or G protein mimic dramatically affecting antagonist off rates, really giving us an idea that we're forming this complex, we're stabilizing this closed conformation, and in fact, it's this closed conformation which is the high affinity agonist binding site. So, putting everything together, we have an assay, we've measured nucleotide, our complex is nucleotide, we have a complex, it's nucleotide free, it's, it's stable so that we can isolate it in detergent micelles. We understand now the basis for how an ag what the agonist in G protein does. We should be able to um, look at its structure. And I'm just going to tease you with this, and it'll lead right into Brian's um, talk, that one of the first things we, first pieces of evidence that we had a receptor G protein complex came from electron microscopy, negative staining electron microscopy. I just want to show you that this was back in 2009. This is two years before the, we published the crystal structure. We had a model of the beta adrenergic receptor bound with beta gamma, the alpha subunit, into the core of the receptor. Was, obviously, there are much more details, many, many more details. But all the, all the reagents that we had developed through our collaboration, all the testing we had done through our collaborations had really helped us to get to this point. And Brian will uh, go into much more detail and, of course, talk much more about um, much more uh, informative structural detail than this low-resolution um, EM. So, I'm going to end my part um, with this slide because I've had the fortunate opportunity um, to work with two fantastic scientists. Uh, Al Gilman was my uh, postdoctoral mentor. He, of course, won the Nobel Prize for discovering G proteins back in 1994. And I was in the lab um, at the time that he won the prize, and it was a really, it was a lot of fun, the celebration. And I regard Brian, I'm going to tease Brian with this, but I regard uh, Al as my scientific father because he's taught me a lot of what I know about G proteins, a lot about biochemistry, a lot about enzymology. But my collaboration with Brian has been over many, many years, and it's been a fun, uh, fun collaboration. I do regard, I, I do consider these two as scholars, mentors, leaders, citizens, and, and friends. And Brian. Um, because we've had not only fun in our collaboration, it's been productive, but um, he's more like a brother. And so I consider him as my scientific brother <laughs> with my scientific father, and I'm really fortunate to be able to work with these two uh, amazing individuals. And I'm going to pass the baton over to Brian, and thank you. Well, um, thank, thank you, Roger, and uh, thanks again to the organizers for inviting us here. Um, it was fun for Roger and I to uh, put this together, uh, typically uh, at the very last minute. Um, so we met today and, and uh, uh, kind of arranged everything, but we had sort of plans ahead of time. So 
we, we kind of knew what we were going to talk about. But um, this, as Roger said, uh, uh, I, want to, I want to bring up two things. First of all, um, we are always falling behind Redopsin people. Um, I'll, I'll admit that. They've always been ahead of us. Um, we try not to acknowledge it. Uh, we, we try to kind of ignore them, uh, but they're always ahead of us. And, uh, and the other, that uh, what I'm gonna tell you about is uh, how much this has been a collaborative effort. And um, Roger's been my closest collaborator, uh, but he's also engaged other people uh, in, into our collaboration, and it's really worked out uh, very well for us. So um, here's the, uh, the picture that you saw. Um, Hmm. Do you have another? Okay. So, um, as, as Roger has shown you this already, or I guess Peter has, um, this is the picture of us returning from uh, the beam line. And, uh, but I want to point out particularly Brian DeVry and Soren Rasmussen. So, um, Brian is the G protein, Soren is the receptor. Who, who got together. These two uh, postdoctoral fellows, a graduate student and a postdoctoral fellow, uh, really did an amazing job uh, on this effort. So um, I was trying to remember back when we started actually collaborating on this project. And Roger pointed out that we had written a grant. And that kind of dates. Um, So it kind of dates things. Uh, so the grant was submitted in February 2007. Um, it's our first grant together, and we had preliminary data there. So I, my guess is around uh, early 2006 that Roger and I actually started working in earnest on this. And um, uh, so uh, you can see uh, the title of the grant was, um, yeah, uh, Structure and Dynamics of Beta 2 Coupling to GS. And uh, you can see this is where you get your score. Now, normally, it's, a, it's a, a number and a percentile. And you can see we just have these two asterisks. So what do two asterisks mean? <laughs> they mean that your grant was so bad, you didn't even get a score. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, we, we proceeded to work together. Um, so I want to just go through a couple of the, of the steps uh, because we, ne we needed all of these things to work for us to get the structure. And what was remarkable is that we ultimately had all of these pieces and, and were able to put them together. So uh, Roger pointed out that our early efforts to make a, a complex, a stable complex, uh, we, we could see that it was stable and detergent, but, but in general, it would gradually fall apart. And one of the reasons were that we didn't have really high affinity agonists at the time, and, um, and our catecholamine agonists were unstable. So uh, one of the first things we did is we just started asking, every time we were at a, at a meeting, we'd ask people from pharmaceutical companies if they would have any compounds that they would let us test. And we ended up collecting roughly 60 compounds, and this was, a, again, a bimane assay made this possible. So what we were looking for, uh, 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 for high efficacy, high affinity, and slow off rates, and particularly slow off rates. Uh, and, and that is a difficult thing just to measure in, in, in a high throughput manner. But fortunately, we had this bimane assay, as you, you remember, uh, going from no ligand to isopaterenol. We had a, um, uh, a, a nice uh, shift in the intensity in lambda max. And if we add now uh, alprenolol, we can see the off rate, basically, it returns to this baseline after about five seconds. So isopaterenol dissociates very fast. Uh, Soren uh, had tested, as I said, a little over 60 compounds and found only really one that had this remarkable property. So it was a very high affinity, uh, 84 picomolar in the absence of G proteins, and its dissociation half-life was 30 hours. So you can see it took a total of 150 hours uh, to completely reverse the bimane response. So this was a remarkable compound, and, um, and actually we had to be a little bit uh, afraid of it because it was so potent that if, 
if you even get a little bit on your, your, your fingers, you might start having uh, a cardiovascular response to it. So uh, the next, of course, was having pure functional G protein in receptor. Now, um, uh, Brian was uh, an expert on the G protein in, in Soren on the receptor, and, and this, uh, we really started working with these reagents. Uh, but what was key, Roger recognized early on, is that um, the nucleotide free state was the stable state, and if you have even a small amount of GDP, it could drive the reaction backwards, so it would destabilize the complex. Uh, and, you know, of course, there were a lot of ways that we could have removed GDP, but the, the most elegant was simply add an enzyme that chews it up. And uh, this got rid of it very fast as it dissociates and was really key uh, for helping us form a stable complex. So this was the protocol uh, that, that uh, Soren and Brian did reworked out. This is the, uh, the receptor purification. You see multiple steps, including a ligand affinity step. Uh, the G protein, these then uh, packagerized by FedEx. Uh, Soren uh, mixes them together. Uh, we separate the complex by uh, the, uh, an antibody that binds to the receptor, and we get rid of excess um, G protein, uh, get, get, get rid of excess receptor on a size exclusion column. And you can see at the end, uh, we have absolutely beautiful complex. And it's all by, by uh, polychromic gel. We can see all of the components in stoichiometric ratios. So this would look really promising, but we get no crystals. So this is many, many different uh, trials, many different conditions, just would not crystallize. Sorry, it just crashed. Okay, so uh, we, we reasoned that maybe at least part of the problem was the fact that the complex, while it looked beautiful after, right after uh, purification, it wasn't entirely stable. And, um, and, and so we want to go back to the fact that, uh, as Roger pointed out, the receptor G protein complex is not entirely happy in, uh, in, in detergent. So uh, at the time we started this work, the detergent, uh, preferred detergent, the detergent that worked the best of anything available commercially was called dodecylmaltoside. And uh, so this, uh, this kind of fuzzy uh, ball around the receptor is supposed to represent a detergent micelle. But you could see uh, by the black trace that um, after 40, uh, two days at four degrees, we started getting dissociation. So we now start seeing some, uh, some G protein and receptor dissociating. I was fortunate uh, to visit uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, and I, I don't remember exactly when it was, but uh, was invited by Sam Gelman, who is a peptide chemist, who had a uh, really talented um, Korean chemist in his lab who wasn't at all interested in peptides, but was making detergents. And uh, Pilsuk, uh, was desperate for people to see whether his detergents were any good. And he would send them out, but often not get any results back. So he said, please send us everything you've got. Uh, and Soren Rasmussen tested all of the detergents for stabilizing properties. And he came up with this um, MNG3. Uh, it's now commercially available, but back then uh, it wasn't. So we were very lucky to have Phil Sook make us um, uh, many, many milligrams of this material. And you can see it sort of looks like two dodecylmaltosides stuck together. Uh, and you can see that it already uh, has an advantage in that it, uh, even at four degrees for two days, we see uh, essentially no dissociation in the presence of MNG3. Now, it had another beneficial effect. One of the other uh, one of the other uh, components that was essential for getting uh, crystals was the use of a special lipid media called lipidic cubic phase. And this was something that was really pioneered by Martin Caffrey um, in, in, uh, in Ireland. And so the, what happens is the receptor and detergent is transitioned into um, this lipidic cubic phase, 
And, and, and as a result of this three-dimensional network, it facilitates crystallization. But one of the problems is that in going from detergent to lipid is that the dodecyl multicide uh, gets stripped away before the receptor can be fully uh, in, incorporated into the lipid. So as LCP strips DDM off, uh, then the receptor is destabilized. So uh, we reasoned that we were, uh, at least part of our problem is that we could put receptor into these lipidic cubic phase, but we might actually be killing it in the process. And so it was important to have a detergent that stuck to the receptor uh, more tightly. And, he, and uh, MNG also did that. So this is an assay where we're starting with just a receptor and we're measuring uh, antagonist binding, dihydroloprenolol. And at time zero, we dilute the receptor into buffer without detergent, below, way below C, B, and C, basically no, no detergent. And you can see what happens if you have the receptor in DDM. The very next time point at 20 seconds, it's dead. We have no, no more binding. If you do this uh, receptor uh, uh, in M and G, you go up to 20 to 24 hours, and it's still fully functional. So this was a remarkable property. Again, we had access to this. Nobody else did. Uh, so this is a real uh, important tool for us. So I want to go back to uh, LCP, because again, LCP was critical for us to get this first structure, and, uh, and Martin Caffrey. So the very first crystal structures of GPCRs, most of them were obtained in uh, lipidic cubic phase using this 9.9 .9 meg, which is shown here. Martin felt that uh, while this worked for receptors alone, it might not accommodate this, this, this um, cavity here might be too small to accommodate larger proteins or cytosolic proteins like G proteins. And so he started working on detergents uh, that were smaller, but actually generated a, uh, a larger cavity. Uh, we were never able to get crystals uh, grown in 9.9, .9, but when we started using 7.7 .7 meg, uh, we started getting our first crystals. And again, this is only available through Martin Caffrey. So now we have reagents really that nobody has access to except us. But even uh, after all of these efforts, we were still struggling to get diffraction quality crystals. And so uh, early on, we started collaborating with Yergo Skiniotis, as um, Roger has mentioned. And uh, Yergo uh, simply looked at our protein by negative stain EM. And you can see these are all complexes. They all look almost the same size. So it looks like Yergo looked at this and said, this looks beautiful. I don't know why it's not crystallizing. But then he started doing uh, further analysis um, and basically looking for 2D classifications. And what he found was uh, interesting, but also concerning. So these are uh, several different classifications. And this was uh, our model at the time of a receptor in a G protein. So we reasoned this was receptor, as Roger pointed out. Um, but we didn't always have all of the components of the G protein. As an example, here it looks like we had some particles where we could fit in virtually the whole G protein. But then we had other particles where we were missing a portion of the G protein, which we call the alpha helical domain. So we were missing this component. And what that suggested was that this becomes dynamic. Uh, so if, if this is in different positions, we will lose the electron density for it. And, uh, and also, if this is able to assume different positions, it will make it very difficult to, uh, to crystallize. Another problem was that the detergent micelle, uh, we realized how large it was. And that meant that almost all of the receptor was not accessible for forming crystal lattice contacts. We had very little polar surface. So uh, we, we wanted to address both of these. So the first thing I'll talk about is what we might do to add polar surface. And this was um, some protein engineering uh, using T4 lysozyme. So our, our very first inactive state crystal structures, um, among them we had to modify the receptor with T4 lysozyme. Uh, and since many uh, of the uh, GPCR crystals have been crystallized with either GPC, uh, T4 lysozyme or some other soluble protein, and the, this was initially added 
to try to add polar surface and stabilize the receptor. But we couldn't use this because this, uh, having T4 lysozyme there uh, prevented coupling to the G protein. So although I thought this would definitely not work, we tried it anyway, and that was putting T4 lysozyme on the outside. And this was done by a um, postdoc fellow in my lab, Yao Zhang Zhu. Uh, and uh, we reasoned that, well, if this was re relatively stable, it could help packing. It, the only problem was that it only had one link to the receptor, where we had two links here. Nevertheless, um, uh, we made it and made this link as tight as possible. Then, again, sent it to Yergo, and he saw, uh, he saw um, evidence for uh, T4 lysozyme, and in this cluster, he also saw evidence for the uh, alpha helical domain. And also, in, in cases where he didn't see the alpha helical domain, he still saw T4 lysozyme. So it looked like, uh, even though we only had a single link uh, to the receptor, that the T4 lysozyme was in a relatively stable position and actually might help with crystallization. So we kept it. But again, um, only 25% was in this uh, alpha helical domain closed. So we still tried to figure out something that might uh, stabilize this. And when we run out of ideas, we always turn to antibodies. And of course, um, when we think of antibodies, uh, we always think of Jan. So uh, what, uh, what we did in this case was we worked out a strategy, Ka Young Chung in the lab worked out a strat strategy for cross-linking all of the components together. So um, this is a uh, homo bifunctional crosslinker, and you can see by the fact that it's uh, co-colored red and green means yellow, that this is, um, this is essentially the complex. Um, we then uh, uh, immunize llamas. This is really not expected to work. Um, and again, uh, here's, a, here's a better picture of Jan. Um, I always think of Jan, looks like he just got off a Harley Davidson. A motorcycle. But he's, he's a very nice guy. And you shouldn't be afraid of him. Uh, and, and, and here's our, another cartoon of our, our single uh, domain uh, antibody fragment. So we, uh, we started with the first one uh, that looked most promising, nanobody 70, uh, 37. We could actually see it binding to the alpha helical domain. It's binding to the very tip of the alpha helical domain. And, and so it, 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 it looks like. Uh, we expected it to look like this based on, uh, on Yergo's uh, 2D class averages. And in fact, Roger has a crystal structure of the alpha helical domain nanobody 37 complex. And I think it's pretty close to this, lines at the tip. Um, but as you can see, it didn't stabilize it. Uh, we could see it better um, because we now had another tool, but it was at all these different positions. So it wasn't stabilizing, it wasn't helping. The next nanobody we were excited about because um, this one clearly stabilized the receptor against dissociation with GTP gamma S. So here's a receptor T4L, uh, the, here's the T4L beta 2 receptor complex. Uh, nice um, single peak. If you add GTP gamma S, you can see it almost completely dissociates. In this case, if we have the complex plus nanobody 35 and we add GTP gamma S, uh, it's, it's stable, so it, it even prevents dissociation with nucleotide. So we really thought this may be doing something good. And uh, um, as you'll see, uh, it, uh, nanobody 35 binds between the uh, alpha helic, or the RAS domain and the beta subunit. Um, as, you, as you'll see in the structure, it binds right here. Uh, but it does not, um, it does not help. Uh, basically, we still have 75% in the uh, alpha helical domain that we don't see in 25% where it's uh, visible. So uh, the next strategy uh, uh, Roger decided we, we should, now that we were stable against uh, dissociation by GTP, maybe we could try some uh, nucleotide or nucleotide analogs that might stabilize uh, this complex. Um, so we tried GDP, uh, pyrophosphate, and phoscarnate. These are all Roger's suggestions. And, um, and the assay was a single particle negative stain, which is a very uh, onerous way of, of testing this, but it's the only way we had. And you could see that actually GDP and phoscarnate, and to some extent pyrophosphate, did stabilize 
uh, the, the alpha helical domain in a more closed conformation, but still roughly 50% in, uh, in, in the uh, flexible conformation. Nevertheless, when we had all of these things together, uh, we actually started to see uh, improvement in the crystals. And finally, when we included uh, nanobody 35 together with the receptor G protein, um, we got our first crystals, or we got our first uh, high quality crystals. And, and that's what, um, what we show here. What I didn't show is um, uh, these are in a special kind of cubic phase that we call um, sponge phase. And uh, it took me um, several days and many wasted crystals to try to pick these. They were very difficult to pick. Uh, but eventually, uh, we got our first crystals into the synchrotron. And the most beautiful crystal, uh, uh, the, uh, the nitrogen uh, source to keep the crystal frozen, uh, got plugged and, and blew the crystal off the loop. So we lost our very best crystal. Um, but ultimately, we were able to get a, a complete data set. And that's why we're so happy. So um, here is the, uh, everybody who gets a crystal structure has to show packing, even though nobody's really interested in it. Uh, <laughs> But you could see our T4 lysozyme um, and nanobody 35. Uh, we actually believe we can see, uh, see phoscarnate. Um, it's, it's in the, it's a some density in the nucleotide binding park pocket, but it obviously didn't keep the alpha helical domain closed. And here's just a, um, a, a view of the complex. You've, you've seen a bit of it already. Here's that alpha helical domain. It gets um, uh, swings about 130 degrees away from the RAS domain. And what's fun is to see um, the conformational changes. Uh, and what always amazes me is that we have really small changes in conformation uh, due to ligand binding. And they translate into these larger structural changes on the inside. So you can see transmembrane 6 opening up, um, about 14 angstroms. The largest change in the binding pocket is about 2 angstroms. And then you have these very large changes in the G protein. This um, C-terminal helix penetrates the core of the receptor, and then here's the alpha helical domain uh, that moves uh, uh, out of the way. So um, here's where things stand today. So the first crystal structure uh, came out in 2011, and um, there was a kind of a long dry, st dry spell. Um, the next crystal structure of the intact uh, receptor G protein complex uh, was, uh, was actually obtained at Confimetrics. It was a, um, a, a D, dop D1 dopamine. And this is, uh, so far as I know, uh, the only case where we first got an active state before we got an inactive state. Um, there's also been a crystal structure of the A2A receptor bound to just the uh, RAS domain called mini-G uh, of G alpha S. But um, there's been a, a kind of a remarkable revolution uh, and in, in the past, and many of you know about this, uh, is that uh, crystal structures are, are, structures are now being determined by cryo-EM. So these are just the structures that uh, ha have been determined by our group. There's also a structure of calcitonin receptor by Patrick uh, Sexton. That's another family B. This is uh, GLP-1. Uh, there are uh, there's also structures of um, rhodopsin, a GI complex and A1A uh, GI complex. Um, we have uh, the mu opiate receptor, um, more recently a cannabinoid receptor. Now the resolutions are getting um, to be respectable, 3.0 angstroms. And um, we now have a structure of, we have structures of GS, GI coupled receptors, and now a G, G11, GQ coupled. So three different G protein families. Uh, but what I want to say is, so first of all, uh, the, these complexes were formed uh, with basically the same way that we formed the complex uh, for crystallography. And then this has informed all of these structures. Also, the detergents that we use here have been very useful here, uh, including a new detergent called GDN, again by Pilsuk Che. Uh, what we're beginning to see is some clues as to why certain receptors prefer or dislike uh, uh, certain G proteins. But even with all of these complexes, we still don't, ha we still don't know for sure uh, clearly what determines coupling specificity. Um, and, and we think it, that's in part due to the fact that we are seeing um, a kind of a late stage in coupling. And there's evidence from a num number of sources that uh, 
that the receptor uh, engages the G protein in a manner that's slightly different from this, and it's maybe that initial engagement that's really determining coupling specificity. Uh, so we still have a lot of work to do. So I want to end um, again with this, uh, this slide uh, showing all of the, the people who um, contributed to this work, uh, particularly Soren and Brian DeVries, uh, right here. Sorry. Uh, Roger, of course. Um, Jan, uh, Yergos, Kiniotis, Martin Caffrey, um, our, my crystallography uh, guru at Stanford, Bill Weiss. Uh, and I want to say I've been very fortunate uh, in having a really supportive uh, partner, Tung Sun, uh, who um, has, has worked with me in the lab and has, has really um, uh, helped to keep me focused on, on research. And uh, then uh, I want to uh, just again acknowledge the, the, all of these collaborators and uh, thank you for your attention. So thank you, Brian. Thank you, Roger. So um, I think we now have time for several questions. And uh, yeah. OK. Thank you very much for your fascinating uh, lecture for us and my question con connecting with the liquid crystal phasing, so uh, L uh, LCP. Uh, what, the, what is the interesting, so what, what is fascination in, in the liquid crystal phasing that uh, protein like GPCR like very much it? So, so why the structure is creating is, uh, it, uh, is in, in these phases. Why? So I, I think there may be a couple reasons. One is, as Roger pointed out, receptors probably prefer lipids over detergent. Uh, and the lipidic cubic phase is more of a native lipid-like membrane. Um, it also contains cholesterol. So it's the, the, the complex is probably more stable. But it also forms a three-dimensional architecture that can uh, facilitate uh, the initiation of crystallization. And, and uh, it's probably both of those that are contributing to uh, the advantages that we've seen in crystallography. Um, I should say that uh, in, the, in the past, uh, since, since the initial LCP uh, structures have come out, people have just tended to go to that, uh, go there immediately because it seems to work almost all the time. Um, however, with some of these new detergents from Pilsuk Che, uh, we're starting to get crystals in detergent again, uh, uh, where we wouldn't have gotten them with just dodecyl multicide. What was your first crystal structure? My first crystal structure? Well, you mean, oh, the very first one? Uh, well, that was in, uh, yeah, that was uh, in detergent. Yeah, it was a receptor, it was a beta-2 coupled to a fab, uh, and that was in detergent. Maybe a question to Roger. Um, I don't know, maybe you have an idea to this, but why the hell we need the gamma subunit in G proteins? What is the reason for this? <laughs> Do you have any idea? <laughs> I don't know, is it stability or what? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. We don't, we, we don't know what the gamma subunit does. I mean, there's, there's a lot of really interesting biology um, done by... Um, uh, um, Oh, what's her name? At, at, she used to be at Geisinger. Berlo. Hmm? Berlo. Kathy Berlo? No, she used oh. to be at Geisinger. She did knockouts of gamma subunits. I'm terrible. I can't, I can't believe I forgot her name. But she knocked out different gamma subunits. And she can completely wipe out, for example, dopamine D1 activation by, by knocking out gamma 7. And so that, that's... There's no structural reason based on any of our data that would suggest any role of gamma that would affect dopamine binding. So we don't know. It could be distribution, could be ex, you know, expression of the plasma membrane wherever the D1 receptor is located in, in striatum. 
you don't know. The um, thing that we, <laughs> Brian and I, um, we've had this pet project that we haven't touched really in years is on receptor dimerization. And um, one of the rationales for not going back to dimers yet is that we sort of wanted to figure out how the monomer worked and all the parameters surrounding the monomer. But it's very possible that a dimer could, could accommodate um, a surface that could bind beta gamma. So the one protomer, that's called the A protomer, protomer would be interacting with, with the alpha subunit, just as Brian described. But the B receptor protomer um, may accommodate beta gamma. If you looked at the crystal structure of the receptor G protein complex, beta gamma is way out in the side, hanging out on the side, not touching the receptor at all. And so it is possible, maybe if you make a confirmationally uh, heterodimer, where one receptor is in the active conformation bound to alpha, the other receptors in another conformation bound to beta gamma. That could be possible, and that's in, in a native system. We just, we don't have the tools to look at that yet. It's a great question, though. Other questions? No questions? <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, maybe please identify yourself before. Uh, Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm <coughs> Stefan from, from Erlangen doing a PhD. And um, I have a question. So let's say the activation, everything occurred. GEP is exchanged by GTP. What happens next? So does the G protein dissociate from the receptor all the time, or is G alpha attached to the protein able to trigger to an adenosic lase or something? So what is the next step occurring after the exchange? <laughs> you know, I'm going to hand this microphone over to Martin Lose. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that because it's a very hard thing to study. And we, we can study these things in a test tube, um, just like trying to stu study receptor dimer. But trying to study it in a, in a living cell is very different. And Martin's lab, as well as um, Michel Bouvier's lab, um, had started to look at the kinetics of, of activation. And their data, depending on which receptor system you look at, would suggest that the one, the alpha subunit doesn't move very far away from the receptor, maybe is still bound in a complex. And two, the alpha subunit and beta gamma subunits in some of the systems on a short time scale also don't dissociate. And so you can see in my cartoon, animation where I had the G protein being activated, I didn't have them dissociating. I had them functionally dissociating. I still had it bound to the receptor, not to say that that's what, it really, what really happens, but that's a, that could explain both Martin's and, and, and Michel Bouvier's um, data. So post-GTP binding on a short time scale, they may not dissociate. I want to come back to the beta gamma thing because part of the risk of crystal structures is that because you see that the beta gamma is hanging out there, people say, well, it's not doing anything with the receptor. But there's um, some hard evidence from Rhodopsin studies from a certain group in Berlin that beta gamma can um, interact directly with the receptor and in either in a dimeric complex, so you have alpha interacting with one and beta gamma with the other, or the beta gamma is a first binder. So I want to hear your thoughts on that if you have. You know, when we were solving, we were trying to solve the, the crystal structure, um, we had a model, and beta gamma, was, as, as you saw, was way away. There was a crystal structure. Um, it was published in Structure. It was the beta, beta gamma bound to a peptide to the parathyroid receptor. Turned out there were a lot of problems with that structure, and the paper was retracted. Um, based on the structural data. So they had this little C-terminal peptide 
that they claimed was bound to the beta, beta gamma in a very nice spot. The structure was not good. It was terrible, actually. It was terrible. But the, the, the data that led to that fragment was very interesting. Um, it was more <coughs> some, bi some cell biology and biochemistry. They, they mutagenized that region and they could show that it would affect um, signaling. And so they had speculated that, that this could be the beta gamma binding site. It, does, it wouldn't fit in our crystal structure, but it could fit in the protomer B idea. And yes, it's very possible that um, it could dock to that site first and then alpha could interact. But it, they're very hard experiments to do, as you know. And um, it, it, you need to make, a, I think you need to make a confirmationally, um, hetero, a confirmational heterodimer, active and inactive, for that to, to really work. Because I think it would be hard to have both receptors active. And I think in our case, to adopt that confirmation, you really need the G-protein um, C-terminus. So I, I can just sort of add a little bit that, um, that s some of the, the, the structures, the cryo-EM structures that I showed at the end, there is some engagement, some interaction with a beta subunit. So we are seeing some of that. It's not, I mean, by and large, they look very much the same, but there is some, particularly for the M1 muscarinic receptor. Um, the other is that for one of them, I didn't actually show it, uh, neurotensin receptor, it has two conformations on the G protein. Uh, so in, in one conformation, there's more, I think there's more engagement with uh, the beta subunit. Um, then there's evidence from a number of different sources uh, that these nucleotide-free structures are probably not uh, the first engagement. They're probably second or third engagement. And um, these come from different, different uh, lines of evidence. From our lab, um, single molecule uh, studies uh, actually identify a, a kind of an intermediate that we see in terms of the outward movement of TM6 that, is, that we observe with GDP bound G protein. So we think there's probably an initial engagement. We don't know what it looks like. Uh, that um, then leads to GDP dissociation. And then you have the nucleotide free complexes. Um, so we have to try to figure out how to look. And that, and that GDP um, state is very unstable, so. Yeah, I, I, I'd also like to add, um, this is another incredible paper that was published on rhodopsin by, by Peter's lab. <laughs> um, so they had defined what was important for heterotrimer association with rhodopsin. And they knew the N-terminus was important. They knew that uh, acylation of the N-terminus was important. They knew that acylation of, ga of gamma was important. But, <clears throat> but um, uh, Oliver Ernst and, and Hermans, it was a Hermans paper, beautiful paper, in which they trimmed back the N-terminus. And they cut back the N-terminus to the point where it didn't interact with beta. So if I, I didn't point it out, but if the N terminus of beta interact N terminus of alpha interacting with beta has a huge surface area. It's larger than an antibody antigen complex. It's larger than the switch two interaction. The N terminal action, um, surface is, is quite substantial. And so as they trimmed back the N terminus, where it was no longer interacting with um, beta. It lost its capacity to exchange, but it's still bound to rhodopsin. But it just couldn't exchange. So that helped us in our argument that we thought that the N-terminus was quite critical for nucleotide exchange. It was actually fit our, our argument perfectly. But it would also highlights the importance of beta gamma. In the beta gamma positions the N-terminus in exactly the right place. Um, to do its thing, and that's why we think it's so critical in our complex, but also explains why we don't necessarily have to have any binding surfaces 
with beta gamma because beta gamma's role is to, is to place the N-terminus in the, exactly the right, precisely the right conformation. And, and we've been able to sort of reproduce that in the beta two. So if you, if you that alpha N uh, sort of positions the ICL2 next to the alpha five helix. And if you get rid of that interaction, you'll still couple, the G protein will bind to the receptor, but you won't get GDP release. So it's very, very similar. Uh, Tabio B from Bolsa Learning Institute. Uh, Brian, uh, you mentioned that uh, you have reasons to believe that selectivity is encoded in the first stages of the interaction between the receptor and the G protein. So can you comment on that a bit? So, so first of all, I didn't recognize you without your mullet. <laughs> 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 uh, so I, I think part of it is just because we don't, it's not, there's no clear um, consensus motif in, in, in the crystal structures that we've, er, in the cryo structures that we have so far. Uh, there are some, um, there are some clues. So in, in GI coupled receptors, uh, as would be predicted from, um, fr from the, the structures of, of uh, onrodopsin, that, uh, TM6 doesn't move out as far. And if it doesn't move, it, it, it wouldn't accommodate the larger alpha, uh, alpha 5 helix of, say, GS. Okay. But, um, but then there's the cannabinoid receptor. It can couple to GS. It also couples to GI. Um, so that doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work. You can maybe find some rules for why one receptor doesn't couple to a particular G protein, but there's still no clear sequence. Maybe, and maybe we're just not smart enough to, to figure out how to find it. But if you, if you for example, look at all of the, all of the uh, amino acids from the mu opiate receptor, a GI-coupled receptor, that interact with GI, and then you look at other GI-coupled receptors, well, they're, you know, they aren't, they aren't all the same. And there aren't even very many uh, uh, that are really highly conserved in, the, in these interactions. Um, but and but and then the other the other re real reason is there are we, we really do believe there's a state that precedes this nucleotide free complex, and if you're going to determine selectivity, you should determine it up front, right? So that would make more sense rather than have the initial interaction with a G pro with a G protein that you really don't want to activate. No, you you want to you know, want to have that interaction with the correct G protein. So it's really the lack of evidence for at least our ability to find a clear consensus for GI coupling or GS coupling. There, there are some clues. I mean, in GS coupled receptors, they tend to have uh, at, at one position in ICL2 a large, either an aromatic or a large um, aliphatic amino acid. But um, beyond that, there aren't, yeah. You're, 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 oh, I, I, can, I can tell you everything about it. You can, uh, you've got to figure it figured out? No, but. Uh, so, so I, I, have, I have a few comments here. So this movement of helix six, to, the, the way you describe it, uh, so to, to what extent it's, it's, it's a reason or a consequence of, of G protein recognition? That's one of, one of the things I had in mind. Then G protein selectivity, you could also define it but which G protein is being activated, not which G protein is being recognized. So you could push selectivity a little bit farther. And, and th this would also explain this priming and these, these fun things that, that people are, are discussing lately. And so, but, but yeah, I don't know if, if this is things that, that you have uh, considered at all. But anyway, uh, we will we'll talk about it. May I add a, a little point to what you just mentioned about our old work on beta gamma and so on. Uh, this, what we call sequential fit, is a necessity because in the vision field, we know for sure that it is a 100% transduction chain. That means quantum efficiency is 70% with almost 100% probability you excite the cell. So there must be a chain that is 100%, which means any rhodopsin molecule finds quickly enough the G protein. Now, the point is that if you wouldn't have such a beta gamma whatever, we do not know what it really is, but mediated first step, it can
cannot be the one with, with, where it immediately recognizes the alpha subunit because in the raw data segment, pH is about 7.8. That was recently now determined by Meta2 spectroscopy directly. So 7.8 at that pH, you have no active Meta2. So uh, it has to have some mechanism to hold the receptor and so to say to wait for the process to go on to form the active conformation. Otherwise, it would be lost again and would have to try 10 times until it finally finds the active receptor. And that is in vision probably excluded. So how is it in, in the field in, in say, the beta adrenergic receptor? Would that, would that be a, a problem or is it just no matter whatever? Well, so I think um, we could, Roger showed data where you have an inverse agonist. It, it completely prevents the G-approach from coupling. He also showed evidence that if you don't have any ligand there at all, it can couple really efficiently if you force things close together. So it, it must be that um, the full outward movement of TM6 requires uh, a, a G protein. And um, so I, I think it's probably similar. I think it's just much less efficient than, than Rhodopsin. Okay, so thanks at the moment. So we will continue it in five, 15 minutes. And I think we had two brilliant talks. And thanks again to Brian and Roger. Okay, I think we want to continue. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ursula Habenicht, and I'm a member of the team of the Einstein Foundation. And it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of our foundation to this afternoon roundtable discussion receptor meet G protein, a molecular dance that is essential for human life and drug therapy. What for a poetic title for hardcore science. I have to say, however, being a biologist myself and having spent a lot of time as an endocrinologist with um, G-protein coupled processes, processes, I really, I like it. And we will hear much more what's behind, behind this dance in a very, very few minutes. And so it is also from my side, um, again, my pleasure to welcome our dedicated guest for this afternoon, Brian Kubilka, Roger <coughs> Sunahara, and our young moderators, Johanna Thiemann and Alexander Hauser. I have to say, when I heard the very first time about this idea that for this uh, afternoon, it should not be a professional moderator leading us through the afternoon, but uh, representatives of the next science generation, I immediately found this a very great idea. Now, before I hand over to you, however, I'd like to say a few sentences to our Einstein Foundation because I guess not everyone here in this room might be so familiar with it. The Einstein Foundation was um, founded in 2009, or in other words, we will have our 10 years anniversary next year by the Senate of Berlin. And it is our dedicated goal to promote, to support, and sometimes even to enable science here in our city. And this means excellence in science. And for this, we do have a bundle of different programs. And again, just to give you a few examples for this. We have this program, it was already named um, Einstein Visiting Fellowships. And what's behind here is that this program gives internationally most renowned, acknowledged, recognized scientists the opportunity to stay here in our city for a certain period of time, to work on a given program, to have a lab or an office, to give lectures, and uh, as it is the case um, this um, evening. And as you can certainly imagine, we are indeed rather proud that together with Ryan Kompelka, we now have three Nobel Prize winners here in our city. 
We also grant professorships, and here it is Professor Iyai, who is a very other and another very prominent example. And we also support the construction of entire centers. And in the meantime, we have a center for mathematics, for catalytics, for degenerative um, neuroscience, for regenerative medicine, for another one dealing with aspects of ancient science. We have even more in different phases of development. And again, as you can certainly imagine, wishes for more. Another important part of our work is to take care for the next generation of scientists, for our young scientists. And again, for us being able to do so, we have a bundle of different programs. As you might have already realized by listening to the short overview I gave to you, there is no restriction as far as the scientific topic is concerned. It is just excellence, what is decisive. We also understand ourselves as bridgings between institutions which usually do not know each other, usually do not work with each other, although it would be, could be very meaningful. Now, last but definitely not least, another important part of our work, public relation. We think we are convinced that the people here in our city should have the opportunity, should have the right to know what we are doing as a foundation, what our fellows are doing here in this city. And this does mean not only to address scientists, but also lay people, as is the case this afternoon. And for this, we try to get our fellows out of the lab or the office and into the city and sometimes to somewhat strange places, at least at a very first glance and at a second one. So we brought a mathematician who spoke about triangles in the architecturally really very unique Jewish Museum. We had a social scientist speaking in the uh, Market Hall 9, Market Halle 9, and for everyone who is a bit familiar with Berlin knows what this means, in Kreuzberg, an American serial researcher in the Berlin Kennedy Museum, the neurophilosopher Jesse Prince in a gallery named König, King. Prince and König, and this having in mind that there was a very close relation, friendship between Albert Einstein and the Belgian Queen Elizabeth. And there is a saying telling that Einstein, whenever he was on his way to the royal family, said, I'm on my way to Königs. Now, today's location is without any question a very, very science-related one, the uh, Leibniz Saal of the Berlin Akademie der Wissenschaft. It's a very historical place, including the remnants of the Second World War, which are still to be seen here on both sides. To come back to the title of the afternoon roundtable debate, Receptor meets G protein, a molecular dance. It sounds as light as a feather. However, I guess we will learn in a very few seconds how much work it means to come up with solid data here, eventually even leading to a Nobel Prize, um, how much energy, how much conviction, how much ability to think outside the box, even if it's against a dogma, and it is not without a reason that already in the 18th century, the uh, philosopher Rousseau stated, scientists have fewer prejudgments than others, but much more consistent ones. And now we are really very curious to learn more about this molecular dance where without it there would be no life. And now it's your floor. Thank you very much.
It's my pleasure now to introduce the members of our roundtable here. My name is Martha Sommer and I'm at the Charité um, University here in Berlin. I'm one of the organizers of the Early Career Scientist Forum on GPCR signal transduction, which many of you will be participating in in the next few days at the main campus of the Charité. And first of all, we are very grateful to the Einstein, Einstein Foundation for hosting us here in this very beautiful venue. And First of all, for a recap, of course, Brian and Roger, Brian Kabilka of Stanford U University and Roger Sunahara of um, University of California at San Diego. You've already heard much about them, but um, I want to say the contribution of the collaborative work of Brian and Roger to our understanding of GPCR signal transduction, medicine, and science in general cannot be overstated. We are very honored to have them here, and it's been a great kickoff to our meeting. Um, joining Brian and Roger is Klaus Peter Hoffmann. If you'll raise your hand, Peter. <laughs> he's an emeritus professor at the Charité as well as the Humboldt University here in Berlin, and he is also my postdoc mentor. Um, Peter has been co founder or founder of three very successful collaborative research centers funded by the German Research Foundation, and in 2010 he was awarded a very prestigious ERC advance grant. Peter began his scientific career in 1963 studying solid state physics at the University of Munich, and then he did his postdoc in biophysics at the University of Freiburg. While there, Peter applied his training in physics to study visual signal transduction in native retinal tissue. And in this way, he was, able to, he was the first to observe the kinetics of G protein binding to a GPCR being rhodopsin. So this was very exciting, the first to be able to really see its interaction in real time. And Peter's work on rhodopsin and its effector proteins, as Brian already said, has uh, set the foundation for understanding the structure and function of all GPCRs. Um, in addition, we have Maria Valtera. Hello, Maria. <laughs> Um, who's been studying GPCR receptor signaling and pharmacology for about the last 20 years. And she brings to the panel a diverse experience in academia and industry, especially in developing signaling assays for a wide variety of GPCRs. So the reason we invited her was we're interested in hearing an uh, outside perspective, also in the indus industrial um, or drug design, high throughput analysis um, of how the structural um, information obtained by Brian and Roger has helped this. Um, Maria did her PhD studies at the University of Vienna, followed by an EMBO-funded postdoc at the University of Copenhagen. She then went to the Ernest Gallo Clinic and Research Center in San Francisco, which she described as a hybrid university industry center to study s signaling and trafficking of GPCRs. Following this postdoc, Maria set up her own research group at the Medical University in Graz, focusing on high-throughput screening and signal transduction. She left academia in 2010 to head a research division at Novo Nordisk in Denmark, and since 2017 she's been at Interax Biotech in Switzerland as Chief Scientific Officer. So last but not least, we have graduate students Johanna Thiemann and Alexander Hauser um, from, well, Johanna's at University of Leipzig and Alex at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, Johanna and Alex were very much involved in the EU cost network GLSEN. I know many of you know about this. It was a, a research network focused on GPCRs. And they were really key in promoting young or early career researchers in this network. And the idea for the Early Career Scientist Forum was, which begins today, was initiated by Johanna and Alex, I think uh, about two years ago. So this was their idea, and they are now also organizing this event. Um, so before I vacate the stage, I have a special request to all of the early career researchers sitting here in the off, uh, um, audience. Please be active, please ask questions, because this event and the next few days is all for you. So please take advantage of it. Um, and now I hand over the floor to Johanna and Alex and our panel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you, Martha, for the great introduction and the, the kind words. Um, and I would like to take up your point about collaboration. And we have heard it from, from Roger and, and Brian before that collaboration was really key in this, um, in, this, in this work. However, it all started with competition, actually. So um, there seemed to have been some equilibrium between starting with competition to collaboration. And, and somehow you've been able to shift this 
equilibration to, towards collaboration, and you even stabilized this, this complex. So um, I would be uh, very much interested in sort of the ingredients of, of, of these um, um, stabilizing um, factors. So, so what was your sort of trigger to go to Brian, who was much more senior at the point, and uh, approach him um, for the collaboration? Um, <laughs> I think what it was is as I got, at least for, for my lab, <clears throat> as we started to understand more and more and more how difficult the problem was, it wasn't, I, I first started off isolating a um, complex between a fusion protein, which was actually first developed by Brian's lab, um, where he uh, fused the G protein to the C terminus of, of this receptor and could show coupling. And it was really interesting um, because it was, uh, we could actually make quite a lot of that complex as with, with beta gamma, it formed a beautiful complex. Um, we even had really crappy crystals on it, of it, and it just, but it ne never really panned out, on, primarily because I started studying the biochemistry of that. And there were, there, there were problems with the biochemistry, there were problems with the stoichiometry, there were problems with the efficiency of coupling. The more and more I studied it, the more and more I think I needed help, for sure. And I was really, um, I can't emphasize how important Brian's biophysical analysis, the TMR uh, labeling, how it shaped how I thought we could look at confirmation and actually measure the receptor. Say, G proteins I can measure. I, kn I knew what's going to be an active G protein and what's an inactive G protein. I knew what's a nucleotide-free G protein and what's not a nucleotide-free G protein. I thought it would be really great if we can um, have a measure of both. And uh, when I saw and did read the details of Brian's first TMR papers, I thought, oh my gosh, this is the way to go. The irony is that with Rhodopsin, they, they, they had this already, and maybe my, mis my mistake was I should have studied Rhodopsin. <laughs> and, and not collaborated with Brian, but collaborated with, with Peter. But uh, no, just... <laughs> but it's really, as I learn, as I learn more about it, I realized my, um, my shortcomings, and I, I needed help, and talk to the expert. No, really, thanks for this um, insight there. And especially I want to go into your small joke, small comment again, about uh, why you should not have started with Rhodopsin. What actually brought you, or the both of you, to study the better too? And um, for example, I know from um, Klaus Peter that he um, started looking at Rhodopsin, like really digged into this, really was so much focusing on this uh, and got an expert in this. Um, what was the trigger for you to start in, on the better two? Uh, for, for me, it was probably the fact that I was trained as a clinician and I was always interested in intensive care medicine. Uh, I, I don't mean to sound crass, but in the intensive care, it's, it's a lot like doing experiments because you have patients instrumented, uh, you know, you, have, you can get information very fast, you're giving drugs and you can get a rapid response. And m many of the drugs we're giving were for adrenergic receptors. So I, I kind of developed an interest in, in this family of receptors. I really didn't know they were G-protein coupled receptors, to be honest with you. But, um, and, and that led me to Duke for a cardiology fellowship. I was meant to be, or I was supposed to become a cardiologist and I didn't, but uh, uh, that's how I ended up in the field. Now that you know so much about it, are an expert on it, would you start with the better two again? Yes, I mean, all, <laughs> all of the work, all of the good work was already being done in Rhodopsin by other people. <laughs> so it was, it was not, a, yeah. No, I, you could also think about like others than GPCRs, or is it really like, are you still that much fascinated by it? 
Yes, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that the farther we, the, the more we know, it seems like we still have a long way to go before we really understand it. And, uh, you know, we've just, we're, we're stuck at the membrane, we're really close to the membrane with G proteins, and, you know, effector proteins, we, don't, we haven't really even included those in the, in, in the mix yet. So, the, it's, it'll be a, a, a field where people can find questions to address for many, many years to come, I think. So, um, since everything has been shown already on uh, Rhodopsin, um, I, I would be curious to hear, uh, Peter, on um, when you first realized uh, Brian's and Roger's work, um, since you've been ahead of the Beta 2 uh, field, so to speak. Yeah, I, I always realized that these guys were the doing the real stuff, you know. As a physicist, you tend to do something with light or so, you know, light. I liked light, I liked, I liked this problem of vision, light quanta and something in the brain and something in between and what happens. How can I explain vision? How can I understand vision? Vision is a typically, for a physicist, Helmholtz and so on, it's a typically physical problem. While these guys are, you are medical doctors, I guess, and, and so for you guys, it's um, quite natural to work on, on, on a medically relevant problem. And so I worked on, on light. It was my first, uh, we met, really met in Würzburg, in uh, Martin Lohse's house, when I was there for, in my role as a guest professor there, and you, you told us, we were both invited with you for dinner, and you told us uh, you guys should have some more conversation, and you put a, a bottle of wine on the table <laughs> and said, you can just talk. And we did, for a long time, yeah, a whole night, yeah. And so uh, this is, was one of the one of the points where I really realized how important and how difficult that is, what he is doing. You know, rhodopsin is so deceptively easy. It is so, it's, you can prepare it in quantities. And if, once you understand how to flash such a sample, you can always get results. And so it's, but it is certainly much less important in medical terms. And so that's the point. So, Maria, how did you meet those guys? <laughs> um, actually, um, 20 years ago at one of these very famous conferences, the Gordon Conferences, and I don't know if you remember this, but we were called out, Roger, that we drank all the wine before the banquet in the poster sessions before uh, by the chair then, and I think Brian was co-chair, and I was tremendously proud. I was just, um, just finished my PhD looking for a postdoc, and Brian had put up as a co-chair of the conference uh, all the posters that were presented to, you know, what kind of categories they belong to. And my thesis was on tree protein antagonists. So I was starstruck with Roger and I was starstruck with Brian because he, he like put my name up there. And so this was 20 years ago, they don't know that, but it's a real amazing pleasure to be here today and sit with you on, on this podium. And yeah, Rhodopsin was a thing as well at that time, you know. Um, so they, they shaped, you know, my academic career all the way through until I went to the dark side, to the, uh, to the uh, industry. And they still do. So that's how I came to it. And I'm still fascinated by those guys and proteins. <laughs> So um, again, on the topic of collaboration, um, so we all now know that's, that's key and it's been key in the past and uh, I'm assuming that it's even more so today. Um, but could you give us some advices to um, young researchers like most of us here in the audience, like how to, how to make use of collaborations or even start collaborations? Um, to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, many collaborations start out of necessity. Um, you you want to solve a problem and you recognize that there's technology uh, or methods that um, you could that could really benefit. Uh, I would say 
then what's important is to find the right person. There may be more than one person that can provide that. And I think having a personal connection is, is really important. Um, I would say there have been a few collaborations which have, while been successful, have been unpleasant. Um, but definitely not with Roger. I mean, we're, um, well, everybody likes Roger, so you can't, you can't not like Roger. Uh, and he's a good scientist, so I mean, you know, how can you not want to collaborate with Roger? Uh, it, Bob Lefkowitz always told me that if for a collaboration to work, you each have to bring something that the other can't do to the collaboration. Uh, and you know, that's not really the case with us. Roger could do everything I could do. Um, I, I didn't know how to make G protein, but Roger knew how to make receptor. So I don't know, I mean, I don't, I don't exactly know, you know but it, it, it was fun working with them. So there, there, you know, there, are, there are reasons to collaborate sometimes, even if you don't necessarily need to, just because it makes uh, hard times go better when someone else is there. Um, and even if you both know the same, you know, both have the same technology, you may, you may have different ideas or you may get, you know, different inspiration uh, that can help move. And I would say, uh, you know, our, our collaboration on the complex uh, often involved Roger recognizing somebody that could, you know, that could, we could engage, um, like John Sterrett, and, you know, bringing him into the, into the group. That was kind of a meandering answer, but. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that Brian I'll give an example. Um, Brian came to Michigan to give a talk at my, in my department. And this is before your talk. We were sitting in the back, and Paul, my chair, was there. And you know, he said, no, it's, you guys, you're, you've been pre pretty productive. I guess things are working. And Brian said, yeah, but we're just having so much fun. And it's been a really fun collaboration. We both like to push the envelope a little bit. We, we you know, we there's a there's there are a lot of there's a lot of dogma in this field. Um, but at the same time, we've both been trained um, in you know data driven, hard, rigorous science, and so we can propose really crazy ideas, and then. Um, we work together challenging our ideas and it's, it's 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 a lot of fun and we've had fun frustrating it's been frustrating a lot of times but science is frustrating but i think that's why the collaboration has lasted so long and why it's continues to be fun and will continue to be fun so we all agree that collaborations is key now even more um so we have uh, Still, so we have a huge GPCR field here in Europe. Um, we all came together, so many of you came together from the former Gliston uh, Cost Action, uh, met there, building new strong collaborations. Um, and you over in the US, you also have like um, many meetings where you can exchange. And so, um, but still, it's, you don't see that often that much transatlantic exchanges or do you have the feeling that this is now more open that the time has changed more exchanges come here yeah i mean brian and i have a um a f really fun collaboration with peter Gminer in erlingen and yes the time is different time of the day it's hard to schedule a skype meeting with germany and with uh, shanghai i mean um uh, Beijing, sorry, but trying to schedule this is tough. But with with uh, Skype and it's it's not a big deal. And you know we try to be economical to figure out how to send things back and forth. Try to package items together and try to coordinate that. But I think the. Um, electronic communication and modern communication has changed that significantly. Yeah, yeah I, I, I particularly like Skype, uh, or I mean, I don't always like Skype. Sometimes it doesn't work that well, but I mean, you know, video conferencing really makes a difference. You, you can 
you can accomplish a lot just by actually seeing. It's not just, it really does make a difference that you're seeing the person rather than just, and you can share documents and so forth. So I think that's really kind of uh, been an important advance for long distance collaborations. Yeah, so Brian and I used to be um, in different time zones. And plus, that was complicating because um, he would travel a lot. Well, I would travel a lot, but he would travel much more. And I need to talk to him because we would talk to each other like during the complex. And we'd talk to each other like two or three times a day. And <laughs> I would call him up, of course, not knowing that he's in <clears throat> Germany or somewhere else and it would be three o'clock in the morning and he would answer. <laughs> but no, I mean, the commu certainly uh, electronic communication, video conferencing has had a huge impact and it, you know, um, now that we're on the right time scale, it's actually easier. Time zone, it's easier. There, there are still some problems in terms of uh, getting biological samples yeah. uh, across the country, uh, even in Germany, sometimes we have trouble going through customs if we, if we don't, if we either describe it too accurately what's in the, what's in the package or, or, or use the wrong <laughs> adjective or, you know. Uh, it's actually, I think, in China, it, I think Germany right now is a bit more difficult than China. Um, China China's been, uh, in the past, has been a problem as well. So, but the, those, are the, those are the major issues, is just getting packages and ha hoping that your cells or your protein survives. So you have to send over your students and carrying in a lunchbox more or less the samples. <laughs> oh. uh, I, I think DNA constructs have been really hard to get from China. <laughs> but it's beside the point. <laughs> So, um, so do you think there is like a like a global GBCR community, or do you perceive it more as a as an American or European specifically? Oh, well, it's definitely global. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Do we have a an opinion from a European side there on that as well? <laughs> or a comment? Well, uh, certainly, uh, I feel the same way. I had most of my collaborations with uh, people in the US. Um, always developed just by some idea and you needed somebody to work with, that was it. And it didn't matter where, 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 where and how, it just came together. And in our case, we had uh, sometimes, uh, for some time we had techniques which we, which we had specially for our lab and so people came to use that and so by the way, that is one of the interesting differences between, well, say the 70s or 80s last century and now. Uh, in, in, in when I started doing work on vision in the 70s, you could build up something which nobody had in the world, just but you. You could, could build up something for 10,000 Deutschmarks. You just had the idea how to realize that and understood maybe uh, on these biological samples you understood a little bit more of the physics of measuring that. And so you could build up something and it was not expensive at all. And today to real progress, if you look into what, what really is done, cryo-EM, it's a matter of hundreds of millions of bucks. And and, uh, or or X-ray crystallography without uh, without a synchrotron, you can forget it, and so on. So it's all very expensive, and so you. But I have a feeling that the real rate-limiting step is still not the technique, but the the ideas. What what does it really mean? What what can I possibly ask? Uh, uh, what, what are the real questions? And that remains the same issue over many, many decades. I actually want to... Um, I, I, I didn't mention this during my talk, but you brought up the synchrotrons. And in, in many ways, had we been successful at getting our first crystals for, let's say, the inactive state in, in 2000, as opposed to 2006, 
we wouldn't have been able to get diffraction because there was no microfocus, uh, there was no microfocus beamline. And it was Gepard Schertler who, working on Rhodopsin, realized that it would really be nice if, uh, you know, these crystals are small, if you could actually shoot the same crystal several times by having a small beam. And he worked together with two scientists who I can't remember the names in, in, in Grenoble to develop the, the first microfocus beamline. Um, and speaking of a competitor who was, who was nice, uh, he brought us to, he brought um, um, me and my, uh, my wife, who had our first crystals, he brought us to the, the beamline and actually let us use the beamline. Uh, even though we were, com we were competing on the same project. Uh, so, you know, there's somebody who recognized an important um, technology advance, uh, showed that it could work, and then uh, beamlines in the United States and in, in Europe and now have uh, really sophisticated microfocus beamlines and making it possible to get all the structures we've got. So everything, like, technique is getting more expensive. Um, we have to use collaborations um, to do things together to get forward. Um, how is the point there for industry in there? So, because industry often has much money, and uh, in some kind of way. <laughs> but um, how is the point there? How is with collaborations? with industry, which also is sometimes, as far as I know, a little bit complicated, because there's a, another focus on there. Um, for uh, It's complicated, yes, yes, there's a lot of money. It was great for me to come out of academia and then just have money to do whatever I wanted. I didn't have to turn around, you know, uh, for an antibody that you have to write a grant, more or less. Uh, and there you just had a chemist who gave you the antibody or the ligand or whatever. Um, I think um, collaborations are actually very important for industry. So at Novo Nordisk, where I worked for almost eight years, um, they really looked for the key opinion leaders in the field because that's in academia, that's where the know-how was, that's where the inventions were made, that's where these great brains were working together. Um, we, for example, had a great collaboration with Michel Bouvier, and it took me about a year and a half to get it from having him there for the first time until we had a signed contract to run a project for three months. So that's kind of how, how what kind of a lag time there is to do that. But industry has a lot of spies out there that go around and screen the paper world and go to conferences and go to Hawaii and go to all these important meetings and then, uh, you know, pick the cherries and try to set up collaborations. So they are tremendously important. A lot of things cannot be done in Big Pharma because there is a whole different objective. Uh, so we, we are dependent on the academic research. And as a small biotech, definitely, I go back to all my friends from academia now and say, oh, Peter over there, Peter Kolb, can you please? Give me some compounds. <laughs> so it's really, you know, you have to collaborate. You always have to collaborate. Yes, you have to compete in academia, but, you know, you only go to the great things and make the great next drug if you have the bright minds on your side. So, so for the pharmaceutical industry, um, how important were these early crystal structures from 2007 and, and thereafter. Do we have, have we seen the fruits out of these structures yet, or is it yet, is it yet to come? I, I think uh, partially. I think it's, uh, most of it is yet to come. We saw uh, from Brian's talk, you know, the recent crystals, 2017, 16, 18, etc. the class B receptors, for example, very important drug targets, um, the crystal just came out a year, year and a half ago. Um, I think we will still see that. I mean, in the old days, you did mutational studies and you started virtual screening based on that. But now we have structures of inactive, active, half active, partial, whatever states. And I think industry is definitely looking at that. And it's, it's really, I think we still have to see that. There are some compounds, I mean, Heptaris, for example, has just focused on having it's a small biotech big biotech actually in, in the UK, 
they started with, uh, you know, their stabilized receptors and did drug screening on those. And I think the first compounds are in phase one now, the muscarinic agonists. Um, but I think there's a lot to come. I hope there's a lot to come. Because the old days you did high throughput screening. You know, you just screen and screen and screen, and that was a tremendously long process. And that is over. That was the low hanging fruit to pick. Okay, we have a hit, we have a hit. Now it's the smart screening that hopefully will come with the structures. As an active participant of many conferences, um, I have also seen there many talks by people from industry. And I personally ask myself the question quite often, um, how much are is industry hiding? Because they pop always out a little bit the structure here, there. And I mean, also, Brian, you have a company. You also know a little bit um, what's, what's in there. How much, is, how much are you really hiding? How much do you know? Do you already solved everything or what? <laughs> I think once it's published, it's patented or it's on the market. That's the answer. There's <laughs> a lot in there that's not out, right? So, and personally, being coming from academia and being in a big pharma, I sometimes like, oh God, I want them to know, you know, because there, there are papers out where you know academic science screen a small library, but you know you screen a tremendously big one, or there are data in the company that are just there, and I thought, oh my God, access to these data would be amazing, but that's the nature of these two um, setups, right? And still, if you, if you dump some projects because they are not like the money for it is not funded anymore, does this then get out after what's published? Or is there much buried really where you can say? A lot of projects get uh, hidden in the corner. And then, for example, you know, a new en vogue thing comes up like dimers or no dimers or partial agonists or this or that or PAMs, NAMs, whatever. And then suddenly, oh, didn't, didn't we have something that could maybe be explained by that? So no, a lot of things, I believe, are still very hidden and will pop up again. Brian, what was the reason for you to uh, found the company? Uh, well, actually, it's, it's my wife's idea, and she's, she's really the, uh, the energy behind it. She runs it. Uh, we were, we were having trouble um, collaborating with com companies at Stanford. So I think it's particularly difficult at Stanford. There was some, I guess, bad behavior on the part of the university with government grants at some point. That, um, uh, so they, they became really, really uh, uh, stringent about what you can do with companies. So if we tried to, let's say, form a collaboration with a company, uh, it would often just take the lawyer so long to come up and, and to agree on, on the conditions that it would, you know, it would be a year or two years and it just wouldn't work. So um, we just decided that maybe if we had a small, small company, uh, we might be able to uh, negotiate by ourselves. Just we've made many mistakes because we weren't experienced enough, but it, it's in. It's more or less worked out. Um, we're very small. We're, we're just entirely owned. We're, we're not, there, there's no venture money. So we can do what we want. Um, we, we get contracts with large pharma uh, when they have a, a, a problem they're trying to solve with either crystallography and now cryo-AM. And the negotiations can go very fast because they're, they're not afraid of us. Um, we're too small. We've learned that. Um, uh, there's no bad behavior that a pharmaceutical company can commit that they can't uh, get, our, get around with a bunch of lawyers. So they're, they're completely unafraid of us, and, and that makes things go fast. Mm. Uh, and there have been a couple, we've had a couple successes. We've, um, we've gotten structures that they wanted us to get. Uh, most recently, we've got a structure by cryo that, uh, with with a compound from a pharmaceutical company, and, you know, it happened relatively fast. I think with cryo uh, and, and there still has to be in, uh, improvements in the methods, uh, but I think it will be possible to get iterative structures at a much shorter turnaround time than by crystallography, and might even become close to um, what companies can do with proteases or other enzymes, kinases. Mm. Um, you know, develop a new compound, 
they'll get another structure. That structure will help them improve the compound. Um, so I think if you have access to a microscope, uh, then I think the turnaround, and, and you, know, you have a talented microscopist, I think the turnaround time could be pretty fast. Yeah, I was going to say earlier, the, um, cryo is changing industrial structural biology a lot because the microscope's actually, in the grand scheme of things, not that expensive. You know, it's like, Four, four million, four or five million dollars, and then the service contract, which is a lot. But for industry, it may be a really worthwhile investment. It's a, it's a pretty, if you're dedicated to just solving structures for the company, then that's probably worth it. What we in academia face is that every, you know, how many, how many um, creoses does Stanford have? Four, but probably three year you can use. It, two. Two. <laughs> yeah, so everyone at Stanford has to share to use those two for all sorts of different projects. So it's getting time is tough. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. Yeah, so we have, we have two. <laughs> or, uh, Maybe you can spare one. Uh, that was the, the kind of... <laughs> I just want to say how much, as Roger's pointing out, how much they're really revolutionizing. Mm. Uh, I showed a bunch of structures, new structures. We've had the bio, biochemical preps of those for, for several years and have just been unable to get crystals. Within the year we've had access to a microscope, they're, they're just, they've all been tractable by microscopy. Mm. So I think it's, it's going to be a huge, uh, a huge impact on the field. So where do you see uh, crystallography in 10 years compared to Quarry M? I, th I think you'll still, still need crystals. There's still the resolution yeah. problem. Yeah, it, it will still be. Yeah. I mean, the theoretical resolution limit um, of microscopy is higher just the size of an electron. Um, so, so in theory, it, it should produce a higher resolution structure, but the, there's so many other issues like radiation damage and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The new cameras have certainly changed one aspect of it. Um, that's what the resolution revolution um, that has brought cryo from the, you know, seven to ten angstroms down to the three to four angstroms. But to get it down to the point, you know, to the, to the one angstrom or 1.5 angstrom levels is really tough. Although there aren't, there's too, one, yeah. there aren't too many crystal structures of GPCRs that are there either. Right. <laughs> Going even more into the future. Um, looking at techniques, do you think it so that we kind of could have at some point the look like to through some kind of technique to really see in cell what exactly is happening at a really nice detail where you really can say, okay, it's obvious, like every student can see this. <laughs> like, could you think somebody of us will be able to th see this at some point? Well, certainly not at the, re well, I shouldn't even, probably not at the resolution that we can in a biochemical system. Um, I mean, the person who's coming closest to doing this is Martin, as you know. And, uh, but um, I think it may be possible to kind of um, merge the kinds of technology that Martin's using and maybe some biochemistry and, and uh, so we have a bit better temporal and sp even spatial resolution, um, but it's probably gonna be not easy. It, I think um, tomography, yeah, again, cryo-electron tomography, uh, may come close if, uh, to, to actually uh, seeing signaling uh, systems that can be organized uh, in a fairly um, stable way. Until we can get into like these kind of details, so especially closer. Um, I myself and Alexander, we both come from a computational background. Um, how 
do you so how do you appreciate or see the impact on those kind of things because also those are limited <laughs> well, I can tell you um, we are uh, always in line for our computational people um, particularly you now with these new cryostructures uh, the resolution is just not as good also I think to some extent there's just more dynamics that um, are making the binding pockets a bit fuzzy. So before we publish that, yeah, this is how the ligand is docked, we like to have uh, the computational people do some simulations to see how stable the pose is. And, you know, we put them in the wrong way and they fly out. So we, uh, we, it makes us more comfortable. Um, we we re really value that input. Uh, in, in cases we, you know, they've provided uh, clues as to a mechanism that we can test experimentally. Um, I would have to say, m many years ago, before uh, I started working with Leonardo Pardo and, and Chavi Dupi, I was really skeptical. Um, and, and maybe I, I was right to be skeptical back then, but I think the methods of, uh, you know, and the experiences has uh, panned out, and I, I think it's a really valuable tool. I don't understand it, but um, I, I, the, uh, the, the, the result of the simulations, I, I think, um, is, is very useful. Well, so the technological advances, though, the chip speed and clusters and C GPUs. And I, I just want to mention that we, um, we would also like to encourage um, questions from the audience. So uh, in case um, you want to chip into the discussion, then you're more than welcome. So at any point. Ah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, um, my question goes to Maybe you introduce yourself also yes. shortly. Yes. Hello, um, my name is Christian. Um, I work uh, with Alex with, uh, in Copenhagen, running a TV chat DB. But my question is, um, now that you've reached this level of seniority, I really, I can hear that you really know your stuff, but I can't imagine how you can keep up with all these details and still run these big groups. And I imagine you're traveling all the time. And I mean, how have you transcended from you know hands-on scientist to where you are today? And is it a pleasant journey? <laughs> Maybe Roger wants to start with his journey yeah. while I came here. <laughs> well, I can't keep up. I, I, I can't, and I'm, I, um, going to meetings really helps. Having a lab, training people to think and training people to analyze, and when they come up with ideas, they may come up and approach and we can, we'll chat about it. When I was a graduate student, it was a different time, and a postdoc, I tried to read everything. I, I spent a lot of time reading, a lot of my spare time reading. And so I miss that. I really miss that. And there's, it's harder now in one way because you have to read everything. But it's easier in one way now because of Google searches. And you can, you know, with, with electronics um, 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 database mining, you could actually have interesting papers sent to you. Anything that has fits these criteria, send me the updates, what's been published. Which we had to, in, <laughs> I'm dating myself. In my day, <laughs> we used to have this thing called Current Contents, which was a paper book <laughs> which had the titles of all the current things in science. Current, two to three months back. <laughs> but it was put in one book. And, and, I, and I used to sit on the subway and go to, in graduate school, for example, I used to sit on the subway and read through, circle, fold the page over, and that was, that was the page of a journal I would have to go photocopy it at, um, at school. I think you also sent these postcards for reprints of yeah, papers, yeah, right? Reprints. And uh, so if you were lucky, a couple of weeks later, you, you got a little letter, and there was even a signature from the author sometimes with kind regards. And it was like, oh, 
you don't do that anymore today, but that was, that was actually pretty cool. You know, in, so, in, in some ways, it's having access to this amount of information is really handy, really nice. One of the problems I find, though, at least among students, is because the abstracts are available, all they do is they read the abstracts. They see a title, they see a cool idea, they read the abstract, oh, I love that paper. I think that's the way it works, because they published it. But they don't go read the paper. <laughs> and that, that's a problem, because there, it's, there's such easy access to many abstracts, and they're all available. At least when, in our day, you had, to go, you had a title, and you had to go get the paper. And you had to read the paper. So, I don't know, it, it, it's hard, I don't keep up. I know Brian complains about the same thing, he just, you, you can't. But this also, um, today you have just more and more paper coming out. I mean like every day sure. on GPCRs there come paper out and um, you cannot read all of those. And uh, still we have also another thing because more papers coming out so more and more um, like experts have to um, peer review and look into this. Well, I think, I think your keywords and your searches have to be better. Yes. And I think you need, well, that's your only alternative, right? Yeah. Because mm. it's just too, it's too difficult. There's a question. Ah, yeah, okay, got it. No, yeah. Thank you very much for organizing this. This is really great. Thanks also for touching on perhaps more personal or career aspects, uh, you know, that might be interesting for us young scientists. Um, I was wondering, because um, nobody has mentioned it yet, but I think it must have played a role um, about teaching, right? So you work in universities. What's if at all teaching has had a role in, in sometimes keeping you f not exactly fresh, but keeping you flexible and keeping you um, yeah, on point, so to speak. Thank you. Well, I'm probably not the best person to <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been very fortunate. Uh, but yeah, I've been very fortunate to have very little teaching responsibility. And so my teaching, you know, I like to say what my teaching is to my students and postdocs. Um, and I think that's, uh, I mean, I think that's given me more time. Um, probably, uh, like Roger, I, I, I would say that considering how long we've been in the field, we stayed at the bench for a lot longer time than most people did. So. So we still, in, in having that time not teaching, I, mean, I could spend time actually doing experiments with people, and, uh, and I think that's helped. I have in the past year uh, gotten involved in uh, medical school curriculum at, at Stanford. So in the United States, there's a trend towards minimizing the amount of basic science. Instead of giving it over two years, a number of schools are doing it in one. And they were heading that way at Stanford, and we just thought it was a bad idea. So I got involved, um, and uh, uh, Paul Berg, who is extremely uh, influential at Stanford, uh, and we were able to get the curriculum stabilized uh, to the point where we now have a, a, a full two years. Uh, but I also um, found that we had no formal pharmacology course, so I also in insisted, along with my colleagues, that we, we do that. It turns out I couldn't find anybody who would take over teaching the course. <laughs> so now I now have more teaching responsibilities than I've ever had. <laughs> uh, so it doesn't, you know, you'd think it would be the other way around. Talking about the favorite and least favorite parts in your work, what was it for you, Peter? <laughs> yeah, I think that is really uh, one of the issues here now in Germany because uh, so much load on my younger colleagues here. Uh, well, I did teaching maybe uh, four or five hours per week. And uh, in, back in Freiburg, I had even less. This is, uh, we all believe that is something, a, a nice situation. It's some, we are happy if you do not have to teach. But I think teaching can be very 
can be an inspiration. On the other hand, um, if we continue in the way we are now going on in Germany, where so much money and resources go into institutes like MDC and so on, where no teaching or almost no teaching is going on, while in an institute like, like ours, uh, uh, Patrick Scherer has eight hours uh, per, per week teaching. And so it, I think there, there is one problem. These, the research in institutions like Helmholtz Gemeinschaft depends much on strategy, on programs, on, 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 on fixed procedures that are, that are big issues. While we need, on the other hand, the ideas of young people in the universities. And if we load them too much with many things they have to do, except uh, other than, than research, the, we will lose a lot of, of, of the resources. We will lose ideas, new, really new and novel ideas. Because, you know, we all have always this term innovation. We have a novel, everybody's looking for novel, novel, novel. You need to some degree some here and there, some quiet hour. You need um, some resources, you need contacts. And then at some point, suddenly you can have an idea, which I lived all my life from. And so uh, this, this becomes more unlikely if you put so much load on young people and they have to teach and they have to care for, their, for, for getting papers accepted. They have very young, they have to review papers all over the place. So there is so much duties uh, so many duties, so that I think uh, putting all the resources into programs might be a problem for us in into this country. We, we lose spontaneous ideas by that. What do you say to that? I think this is a point, in my understanding. Another point um, is which is difficult, which makes research difficult, is like getting uh, grant money, getting support that you couldn't do your work. Um, I don't know if everybody knows, for you, Brian, it has been difficult in the beginning to really do your research because like, you did not get the grants. You had, um, there are rumors that um, you had to work as a medical doctor to support your, um, your work as a scientist. <laughs> uh. I think that's a, not exactly correct. <laughs> so I've, I've I've never worked as a I've never worked as a as a physician to to give money to the lab. Um, I I did I did do it to give you know to pay my mortgage and things. Uh, I mean there, I, I was I was very fortunate for most most of my career. I started out with Howard Hughes, um, and you know I you know like everybody I struggled with grants. Where, where I had trouble was when Howard Hughes dropped me and I didn't have enough grants. And it was just at a time when we were really starting to be able to produce enough protein for crystallography and, and the money was just bleeding out. Um, and uh, so th for a while it was, it was tight. And there was a time when uh, the university re realized that I was about $250,000 in the red and they, they threatened to uh, stop my purchase in. And then I had some angels from, from pharma, uh, and uh, particularly um, Peter Anderson from, it was at Olympic at the time. He, he made several gifts to, uh, to, to my lab that helped me get it through. But um, I, I'd have to, you know, although I like to complain, I, I think I have had it better than most people. Maria, do you think that industry should maybe um, support more Absolutely. science like this? Absolutely, big pharma, definitely. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, it's um, um, biotech, for example, where I work in right now. I do nothing else but you. I, I hunt for money, right, to keep the company going. So instead of writing a long grant, 
I go and go to five investors and uh, instead of writing it down, I go there and entertain and they give me money. Um, it's the, the net is probably a little bit more once you have it, but you have the same responsibility and uh, so far it worked, which is great. Um, you know, Pharma does give out money if you happen to get collaborations, but like what Brian said exactly, the lawyers, you know, even if I want to collaborate with my bestest friends, uh, it has, it, it's months until we sign an agreement just because, oh, that could be this, that could be that. So um, money is always an issue, um, but it hasn't stopped producing good stuff. So There's another question. Although I'm not part of the young audience, uh, audience I hopefully allowed to give, in this case not a question, but it's a little bit of a uh, comment. I'm, I'm not only a member of the Einstein team, I um, spend most of my business life in industry, namely sharing AG and uh, buyer AG, and I like to bring in another, in my opinion, very important aspect of collaborations. And uh, this is on the basis of decades uh, with many, many, many uh, collaborations. And what, in my opinion, is of decisive importance is to be able to develop trust between the partners and to respect each other and to consider each other really as partners. And sometimes I have to say not to be too afraid of what does this mean in terms of patterns. I have to say, at least as far as our company is concerned, in the end we always handled this patent issue versus um, publication issues. And of course, we as a scientist in industry, we also wanted to get our data published, no question about. And uh, I think there are ways to handle this with good result at the end for both sides. This is just for me important to add. It's not always black as far as industry is concerned. This is the little comment. And as far as the question is concerned, I'd like to come back to the title, G proteins essential for life and drug therapy. I really like to hear a little bit more about new ideas about new types of drugs in this uh, context. <laughs> <laughs> I think one question I have for you is, if, if I came to you now and said, um, could you make me a compound that has that exact residence time on my favorite receptor, do you think you could, with the know-how that you have right now, make this kind of compound for me? No. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> P Peter could. Yeah, Peter can. <laughs> <laughs> we should talk. <laughs> I think this is where the combination of the structural work and the computational work uh, has to meet at a point. Um, if you talk about, for example, biased signaling, which is one of these big on vogue things, it turns out it's also coming a lot into temporal aspects of bias, you know, it's not only you measure this at five minutes and the other at 10 minutes or 30 minutes, you have a bias. It's more like how long is a receptor activated, how long is it bound to a compound, how long does the compound stick? And if I go now and say, well, you know, I, I think from my cell biology readout, I know I need a compound that sticks on the receptor for a really long time in order to then have this physiological effect. And then I go to uh, Peter Kolb and say, please do me a little screen and give me a long residence time compound. He's like, ah. So I think that's one of the uh, challenges where computational, you know, maybe even the cryo-EM, the, uh, you know, room temperature cryo-EM kind of stuff can, can help us. I don't know, how do, how do you see that? Well, um, as I had mentioned earlier, we have this collaboration which is requiring us to talk up these different countries. Um, and we've, it's basically a drug, uh, structure-based drug design. And I think for the first time, at least that I've, for the first time, have thought we, we have learned enough, we've learned a lot, and it may have helped us to identify compounds which may actually be drugs. For the first time I've ever had that. I mean, I've thought about it, and in theory it should work, 
but you know we have com a couple of compounds which could really be drugs and to treat people and i think i think structure has helped guided us there i i think so so i i, um, I agree uh, and i think that it's going to be particularly um with the uh the, the screens, the size of the screens, you can do computationally now. Um, Brian Schoikert and his colleagues have virtual libraries of over a million, 100 million compounds. Uh, and, um, and, and Brian's philosophy is find as many different scaffolds as you can. Um, and and this, this novel chemistry probably will have, maybe you'll find novel bi biology. Uh, we, we don't know how to make a biased compound. We probably don't even know for sure how to make a partial agonist versus a full agonist. But if we can use structures to get a, at least a broad spectrum of chemistry, there's a good chance that something there will be interesting. So that, that's one thing. I think, um, I mean, you can tell me more uh, the, uh, about this than, or you know more about this than I do, is that I think we're also, the, the pharmaceutical industry and certainly patients are, are probably more inclined to, or willing to take uh, drugs that are not orally available. They're, they're more willing to take injectables, which opens up uh, you know, peptides as a, a class which um, previously was, you know, every effort was made to make an oral drug. Whereas peptides are much, you know, you, you can get drugs that work much better than you can orally available compounds for some receptors. And I think it also opens up the possibility of of, of small antibody drugs, like nanobody versions that can become um, uh, useful therapeutics as well. So I know that a number of companies are looking into, going back to looking into antibodies as, as injectable drugs. Yeah, and actually, um, biologics in general, I think are the, the threshold is changing now. Um, I, I'm involved in a project which is not um, GPCR based. It's an en it's an enzyme based therapy. And one you know, ten years ago, they they would have thought it was crazy, but we've just finished phase two clinical trials. So, it, technology is changing, and yes, the, the the tolerance for what kind of kinds of therapy um, um, that can be applied are, are are certainly changing and making things more possible. And I should say that that project was totally structure-based. So. Talking about crazy ideas, um, crazy ideas are always high risk, but do, would you say just jump it, just do it, go for it? Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I have my email. If anyone gets receives an email from me, um, the last line after my address is to just get crazy and do it. Just to do it. And yes, if it's crazy, just try it. But I think there's one more question. Um, yeah, it's on. Um, we're talking about funding and drugs and this sort. So when talking about science, can one get the impression that in GPCRs, it's very drug focused. It's what is druggable, and is that an issue to some degree, where some fields might not get the attention they could rightly deserve for just primary research reasons, because uh, grants and focus is on what is druggable, and especially the more and more industry it gets to to weigh into what should be in focus. I think we've been fortunate in being able to write grants on systems that aren't necessarily considered uh, really high-profile drug targets. I mean, the beta-2 receptor, they're, you know, I, I think all the drugs you need for the beta-2 are, I probably shouldn't say this, with few exceptions uh, already out there. Uh, you know, it's, uh, so, but it's, it's, a, it's a system that has gone further than any, other system, with the exception of Rhodopsin, of course, and, uh, and and so you you know you want you want these model systems because you learn something about probably the more practical drug you know more valuable drug targets by keep by by working on these model systems. 
Um, so I think it's been possible to, to get grant money even though nobody believes that we're really going to develop a new beta receptor or asthma drug. Uh, they, just, you know, they just think that it's important research. Um, that said, uh, there has been a tendency, at least in the NIH in the past maybe five years or so, to be more translational. Uh, and so you have to, you have to uh, d make a bigger effort, either, either start working on things that are real drug targets, which I think we do, um, or at least do a better job at convincing them that beta-2 receptors really are good drug targets. I would like to bring up um, a topic that was already um, opened up by Klaus Peter, uh, which is all these stresses and um, pressures on PhD students and, and postdocs. Uh, one of them is, is um, publishing, publish and perish, um, but also uh, impact factors, which are now um, given all these Google scholars and, and whatnot, um, much more comparable. So, so people start using this and now we have our metrics and, and all these kind of things. So just the, the, the bar just raises and um, I would like to hear what are your thoughts on like wh what are your, um, is there some, something, something you can tell us to relieve us from this? Uh, <laughs> I'm just glad I was a postdoc back when it didn't have an H index. Um, I, I really think it's, I think in the United States, it's the, the for, for people who want to stay in the United States system, it's, I don't think it's as bad, but for, for students or postdocs, particularly if they want to go back to China or Japan or Korea, Korea might be the worst, uh, or Germany, <laughs> um, they, they have, um, you know, they have these, these metrics and people are, uh, seem to be judged more initially on metrics. Now, I'm not saying Germany is as bad as Korea, but I mean, but I think Germany is worse than the United States is in this regard. I'm, I'm sure that if, uh, when, we, when we review grants, for example, uh, we don't just look at how many nature papers are, we look at how many papers that have, you know, that have move the field forward. And I don't know that that's always the case elsewhere in the world. But it's, uh, it's getting worse every place. Mm. Yeah, to, to, have to, to have to have a nature, science, or cell paper before you can even hope to apply for a job seems ridiculous. Mm. I think Martin may want to... You have to comment on this. Um, I, I think you're right. Germany is certainly worse than, you, than the US. I remember asking you whether uh, you used age factors to recruit faculty, and you asked me, what's an age factor? Um, so I, I think that's remarkable. But as, as a word of comfort, that's why I wanted to mention something. Um, tomorrow in the Frankfurt Allgemeine, there'll be a statement, a, a whole page, uh, so this is one of the major newspapers here, uh, by the DFG, the National Academy, and the Volkswagen Stiftung not to use those metrics in judging young people. And uh, so we wrote a text uh, to this effort. I hope it will work, but certainly the, it's, so it's by the presidents of these associations to make sure that we stop using metrics in judging scientists, and in particular judging young scientists. I hope it will work and, and alleviate some of those stresses. Maybe, maybe one more comment on this, uh, you can always come to industry, okay, we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, uh, we, we never look really at how many papers or age factors we want to, we, we take people that, at least at Novo Nordisk, we did that, that had a really an expertise in a certain field that we really needed. And uh, so, and there are amazingly bright people there too, believe it or not, so uh, you can always choose that dark side if you want. I want to say one other thing is, as I think we probably all know, that when students or postdocs come to us with a story, they, particularly if they're from, you know, Japan, China, Korea, or Germany, they really want that to be a story that's publishable in Nature, Science, or Cell. And it, it just may not, it may not be, you, you may not be able to sell it. Uh, and, and so it often leads to a more protracted, you know, well, let's add more data, and it, rather than just, you know, s s package or, or, or publish a nice piece of data 
and then move forward, it's, it's often just struggling to make it, give it that extra um, selling feature, which is really frustrating for everybody. Uh, and it means it takes longer, and people are spending longer in their postdocs trying to get that extra edge so they can get their paper into Nature Science as well. It's, uh, I think it's having a real adverse impact on, in overall. So you'd rather um, like to publish papers in a lower impact factor, but where you know it really will get read to those specific people, uh, people because the journal fits better? So that's also fine, or well, I, are you still yeah. like the idea of hunting for the big journals? Nowadays, we're always hunting for, for big journals because that's what people need. Uh, but, you know, when I was a postdoc, I was really happy to have a paper in journal JBC, biochemistry, molecular pharmacology. They were, you know, they were just fine. Uh, because I came from, because I wasn't a graduate student, and I, I was also pretty ignorant of the literature, I really, if you would have told me your paper is going to be published in Nature or JBC, I would not have really known who cares, what's the difference. When, when I was a postdoc in Freiburg, uh, I didn't even know about things like publication strategy. I had no idea what that could possibly be. I, we sent our stuff to Feb's letters because it was immediately published. <laughs> we, this, was, this was new and we were in a competition. We had to publish quickly. And so that was it. And so I think the thing with the impact factor and the age value and so whatsoever um, has to do with the this is has to do with the fact that compared to the U.S., at least in our country, and I was a member in quite a few committees looking for new people, you know, uh, finding people for positions, recruiting young people. All this tenure system, who gets tenure and why? This is so central to everything. And it is, in this country, not well developed anymore. I think it is, it, it's getting worse now, it's too much, as far as I can observe it. I'm now out of that game, you know. But as long as I took part in all this, I can tell you I saw so many cases where if you have 100 people who apply for a position, how do you select the first selection? 10% of these guys, you cannot handle 100 applications. So, okay, now you have something like the age factor. Mm -hmm. And in these lists, you always have age factor, cumulative impact factor, all this stuff. And as a matter of fact, as far as I at least saw it, it is the first step is always according to these numbers. And so I think that the U.S. are in this, not in many regards, but also in this regard, simply better organized because you guys look for the real meat. What's going on? What, what did he, she really do? And you take, you take your time to find this out. And maybe we are, we are not really lazy, I think, here in this country. That's not the point. But we possibly, with all this teaching and stuff, we are so overloaded with, not me, but younger people, overloaded with so many, with so many things that hinder you to care for these really important things. If you, for example, in charity, you have now a, 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 a curriculum in the last two years, I, I, I contributed to that. You had the dogma, this must be small groups of students, 20 people. Okay, so I had to give three courses in the morning at 8, at 10, and at 12. It was the same stuff three times. And I told these people at 8, you know, because it was 60 people. And 20, 20, 20, that was the idea but it wasn't a reality. Reality was that at eight, two people appeared, <laughs> and at, at 10, uh, you know, 52, uh, and at 12, six people. That, that was because there was lunch approaching, 
And in the morning, nobody was, you know, wake enough to, 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 do, to, to come. So that, but the dogma was 20 people in a group. They gave it up now, hopefully. But at that time, that was a, you know, as a professor and director of an institute who would have to care for the next generation of scientists and to recruit, you spend the whole morning with such, you know. So That is oh. our problem. So I have a suggestion, but of course that one solves the problem, and maybe it sounds a bit provocative, but um, when, when people present their research, you always see um, et al. Science, Nature, 2011. Why don't people just put the title of, of the story? Isn't that important? Like, what was it about, not where it was published? Shouldn't be the merit of uh, it being presented enough? Um, but it seems like this is kind of sub subconsciously putting into people's mind that that's the, that's the most important. It's, it's where it's published, not what it's about. Um, but, and I think um, some people have more power than others to um, maybe get away from that. Um, and I'm looking forward to read this uh, article in, in the newspaper. So should we have maybe um, one or two more questions? Slowly approaching the. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's, I don't know if you, if you were going to close, um, but I, because we have had a scoop of tomorrow's newspapers and we seem to have some policy makers or influencers in the room, Klaus Peter just mentioned dogma. I think you can hate, uh, demonize age uh, uh, factors. And then a different thing will come up and then you will optimize for that metric instead of what's important and this will keep going on. But now in Germany there is this dogma of uh, excellence and, and distinguishing between excellent science and simply good science. So I was wondering if we could hear some, some comments about that uh, on the room, if, if it's not taking us much out of the discussion, I don't know. Well, I mean... Excellence is effort, so you have to really have an effort to, to determine someone's expertise and whether they're excellent. You need to interview them, you need to talk to them, you, you need to have pretty extensive time with them. And I think for recruiting, if everyone could do that, every, every institute would be fantastic. Um, I think what's happened is the H factors are easy. You just look it up or whatever. And it's a, it's, a, it's a line item, but I think we need to spend more time researching people and what they, what they really do and what they really, you know, are they, um, are they really capable of, of um, being a PI or, or being a leader. Um, some d being su successful in research is not necessarily being creative. Um, it's not necessarily, I should say, not solely being creative, not solely being a, an innovator or a technician, not solely being this. It's sort of a, a, a distribution. And people have different... Um, strengths and I think you need to spend the time interviewing and finding out what those strengths are and I think one of the problems is we just don't spend the time institutions um, search committees just don't spend the time <laughs> well we complain about it <laughs> but don't spend the time necessarily to really look for excellence So can, I, can I actually ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, Roger, I think, handled that one perfectly. But I want to ask a question uh, to the audience. Uh, in the United States, and I'm sure even here, people are starting to use preprint servers. And um, I, have a, I have a source of funding that requires I use a preprint server. And uh, my students, who are certain students, particularly those from Asian countries, are very anxious about submitting material before it, before it even gets sent out for review. And I'm just curious how many of you would be willing 
to submit to a preprint server? Hands up. <laughs> okay, how but, many? <laughs> okay, how and many how many would not? <laughs> All right. So. And, and how many have done it? <laughs> All right. It, uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen. It's, I think it's, um, there are already uh, some little controversies that I've, I know of, but it'll be interesting to see. If everybody, if, if everybody submitted to the same preprint server, I, I think they do this in physics. Basically, mm. there is no nature science or cell for physics. They just submit them all to a certain preprint server, and that's, and that's the record of their work, right? Yeah. I think that's a really important issue. Uh, because I, I do agree that the publication system sucks, and it sucks more in life sciences and medicine than in any other discipline. And so, you know, Michael, our son, is, is in physics, and for them it's totally natural to submit to archive. And this is where actually the action is. And, and journals like Nature go to archive and approach the authors and ask for the papers. So it's the other way around. And I think we really have, have a problem there. And it's probably up to us, the, the older ones, to make sure we establish such a system in, in the life sciences. I think that's of utmost importance. And I think we, we all have to go there. Uh, because that will bring back also the, the power to the scientists rather than to the journals and the, the publishers. Great. I think it concludes it nicely. Do you um, want to close the session? <laughs> yeah, thanks um, so much uh, So for this really nice word, looking into the future, looking to see um, how, how the more established researchers are trying to um, inspire us younger people um, to, yeah, to, to, to establish collaborations from young to older ones to um, I get to see all the changes in there. So um, for me, this was really, really nice to talk about all these more private things, all these future perspectives, where to go, what to look at. And I want to thank all of you for your time and also the audience for the questions. We already sent it around an email and tried to include in the panel some of those questions. Many thanks to those who submitted some ideas. And um, for those of you who um, actually ask your questions, many thanks to you. Thank you.